Harper Audio presents Face the Music, A Life Exposed by Paul Stanley. This is the author. To My Family Prologue Adelaide, Australia, March 3rd, 2013 I sit down and look in the mirror, staring for a moment into the eyes peering out at me. The mirror is surrounded by high-watt theater-style bulbs, and on the table in front of the brightly lit mirror is a small, black makeup case. We hit the stage in about three hours, which means it's time for the ritual that has defined my professional life for 40 years. First, I wipe my face with an astringent to close the pores. Then I grab a container of Clown White, a thick, cream-based makeup. I dip my fingers into the tub of white goo and start applying it all over my face, leaving some space open around my right eye, where the rough outline of the star will be. There was a time when this makeup was a mask, hiding the face of a kid whose life up to then had been lonely and miserable. I was born with no right ear. I'm deaf on that side, too. And the most searing early memories I have are of other kids calling me Stanley the One-Eared Monster. It was often kids I didn't even know, but they knew me, the kid with a stump for an ear. When I was out among people, I felt naked. I was painfully aware of being constantly scrutinized, and when I came home, my family was too dysfunctional to provide any kind of support. Once the white is on, I take the pointed end of a beautician's comb, one with a metal point, and sketch the outline of the star freehand around my right eye. It leaves a line through the white makeup. Then, with a Q-tip, I clean up the inside of the star. I also clean up the shape of my lips. The character taking shape on my face originally came about as a defense mechanism to cover up who I really was. For many years, when I first put this makeup on, I had a sense of another person coming out. The insecure, incomplete kid with all the doubts and all the internal conflicts suddenly got painted away, and that other guy came out. The guy I had created to show everybody that they should have been nicer to me, that they should have been my friend, that I was someone special. I created a guy who would get the girl. People I'd known earlier in life were astonished by my success with Kiss, and I understand why. They never knew what was going on inside me. They never knew why I was the way I was, what my aspirations were. They never knew any of that. To them, I was just a fuck-up or a freak, or a monster. Next, I get up and go into another room. There's usually a bathroom adjoining the dressing rooms. I hold my breath and powder my entire face with white powder. This fixes the white to my face and allows me to sweat through it during the show. At this point, I can touch the white and it doesn't come off on my finger. I learned this part of the process by trial and error. Early on, I would be blinded by the makeup running into my eyes. As a young kid, I used to dream that when I got older, I would become a masked crime fighter. I wanted to be the Lone Ranger. I wanted to be Zorro. I wanted to be the guy up on a hill on a horse with a mask on. That vision I saw in movies and on television. This lonely kid wanted to do that, and this lonely kid ended up doing that. I made my own reality. The character I created, the Star Child, would go up on stage and be that guy, the superhero, as opposed to the person I really was. I reveled in being that guy. But sooner or later, I had to go back down the stairs. I had to come off stage. When you come down those steps, you are confronted with the totality of your life. For many years, all I could think when I left the stage was, now what? Back then, home was a sort of purgatory. During the short periods when Kiss was not on the road, I would sit on the sofa in my New York City apartment and think, Nobody would believe that I'm home and have no fucking place to go. The band was my life support system, but it was also a way to stave off establishing the types of relationships that constitute a real life. At home, all I felt was hunger. An important need wasn't being addressed, wasn't being filled by anything else. In one sense, I was always on my own, remote and inaccessible. But in another sense, I couldn't stand to be on my own. With time, the line between the character and the man blurred. I began to take part of that guy off stage with me. Girls wanted that guy. People just assumed I was that guy. Still, I knew I really wasn't that guy. I could suspend reality on stage, but I couldn't sustain it. Getting through the whole day as the star child was difficult. 
because I didn't believe it. I knew the truth. I knew who I really was. I was also very defensive. When people around me poked fun at each other, I could dish it out, but I couldn't take it. I knew it must be much nicer to be able to laugh at yourself, to laugh about your own quirks and shortcomings, but I still couldn't get myself to that place. I couldn't let go. It was an instinctive reaction to having been constantly scrutinized and ridiculed as a child. I was still too insecure, too self-conscious. Though I didn't fully understand it myself, and nobody around me did either since I never revealed anything about my ear, I was still fueled by the bitterness of my past. I imbued my jokes with undertones of maliciousness at other people's expense. Hit me once, and I'll hit you twice. It's easy to live your life with your hand closed, but you get nothing with a fist that you can't get in multitudes with your hand open. Unfortunately, that message was lost on me for a long, long time, and throughout that time, I felt a sense of struggle within, a sense of dissatisfaction, inadequacy, and profound loneliness. After the white makeup is fixed with powder, I go back into the dressing room, sit down at the mirror again, and brush away any powder inside the shape of the star around my eye. Next, I trace the outline of the star with a black eyebrow pencil. Then I take black grease paint, which is a little waxier than the clown white, and use a brush to paint in the star. I go into the other room again and fix the black makeup with talcum-based baby powder, which is less opaque than the white theatrical powder on the rest of my face. I return to the dressing room and line my left eye and eyebrow with black waterproof eyeliner. As it dries, I look in the mirror. In earlier periods of my life, I didn't necessarily like the person I saw when I looked in the mirror. But I was trying, trying to become the person I wanted to be as opposed to remaining complacent. The problem was, no matter what I tried, nothing seemed to get me where I wanted to go. As KISS endured its ups and downs, I realized at various times that many of the assumptions that I held about what would satisfy me, or perhaps just make me comfortable with myself, had been wrong. I thought the fix was being famous. I thought the fix was being rich. I thought the fix was being desirable. By 1976, with the success of the KISS Alive album, we became famous. But I found that rubbing my fame in people's faces didn't make me feel any better. By the end of the 1970s, we had made millions of dollars. But I found that the money and the clothes and the cars and the collectible guitars I bought with it didn't make me happy either. And as far as being desirable, from the moment of the release of our first album, sex was available any time and all the time. But I found I could be with somebody and still feel alone. I once heard someone say that you're never more alone than when you're sleeping with the wrong person. That's true. And while there are worse ways to suffer than betting penthouse pets and Playboy Playmates, the happiness of those experiences proved transient. Exhilarating, yes, but momentary. I learned that none of it, while enjoyable, could take the place of whatever I felt was missing inside me. When Kiss eventually took off the makeup in 1983, I occupied the Star Child character even more, or rather the character occupied me. My own face became the face of the Star Child. I had banished to some extent the shy, defensive, unpopular kid inside, but I hadn't replaced or rebuilt him. I was something of a shell, an empty vessel. I was still searching for the person I might become, and the star child, now without the visible star, remained very much the mask I wore to interact with the world. But I still found, or at least believed, that keeping people at arm's length was easier than dealing with them in a more personal and intimate way. After all, in order to be comfortable with other people, you have to be comfortable with yourself, and I still wasn't. As a result, my life wasn't adding up correctly. Where was the family? Where were the friends? Where was the place to call home? There was simply no getting away from the fundamental truth that I still wasn't comfortable in my own skin. When you can't get away from the truth, you either numb yourself or fix yourself. It's that simple. And it's in my makeup, no pun intended, to fix myself, not numb myself. Even at the most painful moments of my life, when my band seemed to be falling apart, when people around me fell by the wayside because of drugs, when I lay crumpled on the floor in despair after I got divorced from my first wife, a sense of self-preservation and an urge to improve myself always overrode any other impulses. For some people, a near-death experience causes the epiphany that changes the course of their life. 
In fact, if you page through a stack of rock and roll memoirs, you might think every musician is required to have a close call with the beyond that becomes the definitive milestone in his or her life. But I never tried to kill myself, and I never did much in the way of drinking or drugs, so I can't say I ever woke up in a hospital after being resuscitated, forced to take stock of my life. Still, I have had a few brushes with death, and in those moments the gravity of the situation certainly triggered soul-searching. But to tell you the truth, none of those near-death experiences had as powerful an effect on me as something that might not seem so rock and roll. Instead of coming when I had a gun in my mouth or a defibrillator on my chest, my epiphany came to me on the set of a Broadway musical. In 1999, I landed the lead role in the Toronto production of Andrew Lloyd Webber's Phantom of the Opera. The title character is a music composer who wears a mask to hide a horrible facial disfigurement. And there I was, the kid born without an ear, Stanley the monster, who had spent his life playing music with his face obscured by makeup, playing that character. One scene in particular touched a psychological nerve in me. In his cape and mask, the Phantom has a dangerous but elegant appeal. Just before he steals away his love interest, Christine, and takes her to his lair, he leans in close to her and she pulls off his mask, revealing his horrid face. Something about his being unmasked and her touching him in that moment of intimacy struck a deep chord inside me. One day during my run as the Phantom, I received a letter addressed to me at the theater. It was from a woman who had recently seen the production. You seem to identify with the character in a way I haven't seen in other actors, the woman wrote. She went on to say she worked for an organization called About Face, which was devoted to helping children with facial differences. Would you possibly have any interest in getting involved, she asked. Wow, how did she pick up on that? I had never spoken about my ear. As soon as I'd been able to grow my hair long as a teenager, I'd simply hidden my ear and never addressed my deafness. It was something I kept private, secret. It was too personal and too painful, but I decided to call the woman. I wasn't sure what to expect. I wasn't sure what to say. But I opened up to her, and it felt good. Soon I started working with her organization, talking with children and their parents about my birth defect and my own experiences, sharing in their experiences. The effect it had on me was amazing. I felt freed by talking about something that had always been so private and personal and painful. The truth had set me free. The truth and the phantom of the opera. Somehow putting on the phantom's mask had allowed me to uncover myself. In 2000, I became a spokesman for About Face. I found that helping others helped me heal myself. It created a calm in my life that I had never known before. I had been looking for external factors to pull me out of the abyss when all along the problem was inside me. You can't hold someone else's hand when your own hand is balled in a fist. You can't find beauty around you when you don't find it inside. You can't appreciate others when you are immersed in your own misery. I realized it wasn't people who showed their emotions who were weak, but the ones who hid their emotions who were weak. I needed to redefine what it meant to be strong. Being a real man meant being strong, yes. Strong enough to cry. Strong enough to be kind and compassionate. Strong enough to put others first. Strong enough to be afraid and still find your way. Strong enough to forgive. And strong enough to ask for forgiveness. The more I came to terms with myself, the more I was able to give to others. And the more I gave of myself to others, the more I found I had to give. Not long after this transformation, I met Aaron Sutton, a smart, confident, practicing attorney. From the very start, we were totally open and honest with each other. There was zero drama. She was understanding, nurturing, stimulating, and above all, consistent and self-assured. I'd never met anyone like her. We didn't rush into a relationship, but after a few years, we both realized we couldn't imagine not being together. I never hoped for a relationship like this, I told her because I didn't know something like this even existed. This is the life I was searching for. This is the payoff. This is what it feels like to be whole. It was a quest, an unending push for what I thought I should have, not only materially, but in terms of who I should be that enabled me to reach that point. 
It was a quest that began with the aim of becoming a rock star, but that ended with something else entirely. And that's really what this book is about. It's also why I want my four kids to read this book someday. Despite the fact that the path I took was long and arduous and meandered through some pretty wild places and times, I want them to understand what my life was like, warts and all. I want them to understand that it really is up to each one of us that anyone can make a wonderful life for himself or herself. It may not be easy. It may take longer than you think, but it is possible for anyone. I collect my thoughts and look into the mirror again. There staring back at me is the familiar white face and black star. All that's left to do is empty a bottle or two of hairspray into my hair and vault it up to the ceiling. And put on the red lipstick, of course. These days it's hard to stop smiling when I wear this face. I find myself beaming from ear to ear, content to celebrate together with the star child who has now become a dear old friend rather than an alter ego to cower behind. Outside, 45,000 people wait. I picture taking the stage. You wanted the best, you got the best, the hottest band in the world. I count into Detroit Rock City and off we go. Me, Gene Simmons, and Tommy Thayer descending onto the stage from a pod suspended 40 feet above as the huge black curtain drops and Eric Singer beats the drums below us. Fireworks, flames, the initial gasp of the crowd hits you like a physical force. Kaboom! It's the greatest rush imaginable. When I get out there on stage, I love to look out and see people jumping, screaming, dancing, kissing, celebrating, all in a state of ecstasy. I bask in it. It's like a tribal gathering. Kiss has become a tradition, a ritual passed down from generation to generation. It's an amazing gift to be able to communicate with people on that level and have so many of them out there, all of them, all of us, together, decades after we started. The smile will not leave my face through the entire set. Best of all, that smile will remain on my face as I walk off the stage to return to the totality of my life. There are people who don't want to go home, who never want to go home. And once upon a time, I didn't either. But these days, I love going home. Because somewhere along this long road, I finally figured out how to create a home, a real home, the kind of home where your heart is. Part 1. No place for hiding, baby. No place to run. Chapter 1. Home is an interesting concept. For most people, it's a place of refuge. My first home was anything but. I was born Stanley Burt Eisen on January 20th, 1952. The New York apartment my parents took me home to was on West 211th Street and Broadway at the very northern tip of Manhattan. I was born with an ear deformity called microtia in which the outer ear cartilage fails to form properly and, to varying degrees of severity, leaves you with just a crumpled mass of cartilage. I had nothing more than a stump on the right side of my head, and my ear canal was also closed, so I was deaf. That left me unable to tell the direction of sound and, more importantly, made it incredibly difficult for me to understand people when there was any kind of background noise or conversation. These problems would lead me to instinctively avoid social situations. My earliest memory is being in our darkened living room with the shades drawn, as if to keep the conversation a secret between only my mother, my father, and myself. If anyone ever asks you what happened to your ear, my parents told me, just tell them you were born that way. If we ignore it, my parents seem to intimate, it doesn't exist. That philosophy would rule our house and my life for much of my childhood. I got simple answers for complex situations, and despite the fact that my parents wanted to ignore it, nobody else did. Children seemed to detach the person from the deformity. I became an object instead of a little kid. But children weren't the only ones staring at me. Adults did, too, and that was even worse. One day in a market on 207th Street, just down the road from our place, I realized one of the adults in line was staring at me like I was a thing instead of a person. Oh, God, please stop, I thought. When somebody stares at you, it's not limited to you and that person. Treatment like that draws attention, and becoming the center of attention was horrific. I found the scrutiny and relentless attention even more excruciating than being taunted. Needless to say, I didn't have a lot of friends. 
On my first day of kindergarten, I wanted my mother to leave as soon as she got me to the door of the class. She was proud, but I didn't want her to leave for the reason she thought. It wasn't because I was independent and sure of myself. I just didn't want her to see me being stared at. I didn't want her to see me treated differently. I was in new surroundings with new kids, and I didn't want to go through that in front of her. The fact that she was proud of me told me that she didn't understand anything about me. My fears went over her head. One day I came home crying. Somebody spat in my face. I wept. I had come home looking for support and protection from my mom. I assumed she would ask who had done it and then go out and find the kids' parents and tell them such behavior was unacceptable. But instead, she said, Don't come crying to me, Stanley. Fight your own battles. Fight my own battles? I'm five. I don't want to hurt anybody. I just want people to leave me alone. But I went back out, and about an hour later, I found the kid who had spit on me. I punched him in the eye, but he barely seemed to remember the incident and couldn't figure out what the big deal was. One thing was clear after that. Home was not a place where I could find help. Whether I was beaten up or taunted or anything else, I had to handle it on my own. We lived practically next door to PS 98, my public elementary school. The school complex had three different yards, each separated from the others by chain-link fences. There was a kid whose name I didn't know, but who knew mine, who shouted at me from behind the fences between the yards. Whenever he spotted me someplace where I couldn't get at him, he'd shout, Stanley the one-eared monster! Stanley the one-eared monster! I had no idea how this kid knew me, and all I could think was, Why are you doing this? You're hurting me. You're really hurting me. He was a normal, nondescript kid about my age, with brown hair, small enough that I thought I could beat him up if I ever caught him. But he was always out of reach, always on the other side of a fence or on the other side of a yard, and able to run away into one of the nearby apartment complexes before I could get to him. If only I could catch this kid. And then one day, I finally did. I heard him shout, Stanley the one-eared monster! And as always, the first thing I did was cringe. I heard the voice in my head pleading, Stop doing that! Other people can hear you. Other people are looking at me now. And as always, there was no place to go to escape the stairs. But this time, I managed to run him down and grab him. He was suddenly terrified. Don't hit me, he cried, looking like a frightened rabbit. Stop doing that, I said, grasping him. Stop doing that to me. I didn't hit him. Suddenly facing him like that, I didn't want to. I hoped not hitting him would be enough to put me in his good graces, so I let him go. He couldn't have been thirty yards away before he turned back and yelled, Stanley the one-eared monster! Why? Why are you doing this to me? Why? Although unable to articulate it, I felt incredibly vulnerable and naked, unable to protect myself from the stares, taunts, and scrutiny that seemed everywhere. So I developed an explosive temper as a little boy. Rather than recognize my temper as a sign that I needed help and support and guidance, my parents dealt with it by threatening me. If you don't get that under control, they said in a darkly menacing tone, we're going to take you to a psychiatrist. Now, I had no idea what a psychiatrist was, but it sounded ominous. It sounded like a diabolical form of punishment. I pictured going into a hospital room and having somebody torture me. Not that I felt safe at home anyway. My parents frequently went out at night and left me and my sister Julia, who was only two years older than I was, home alone. Don't open the door for anybody, was all they'd say, leaving a six-year-old and an eight-year-old all on their own. We were so scared we slept with knives and hammers under our pillows. We would wake up early the next day to sneak the weapons back to where they belonged so our parents wouldn't yell at us. I shared the one small bedroom of our apartment with Julia. My parents slept on a pull-out sofa in the living room. Julia started to have mental problems at a very early age. My mother said she'd always been different, even as a baby. She was wild and prone to violence. My sister scared me. And as my own problems intensified, I spent a good deal of time worrying I might end up like her. My parents may not have been very supportive of me, but then again they were not very supportive of each other either. My mom, Eva, was domineering, and my dad, William, resented it. My mom portrayed herself as strong and my dad as meek. 
She considered herself the smart one. In actuality, my dad was very bright and well-read. He had graduated from high school at age 16. Had circumstances been different, he would have gone to college. But his family insisted he start working to help pay the bills, and he did. By the time I came along, my dad worked 9 to 5 as an office furniture salesman. Taken out of necessity, the job was one that, with time, he came to accept, but never to embrace. My mother was a stay-at-home mom when I was little, but she had previously worked as a nurse and as a teacher's aide at a school for children with special needs. Eventually, she started back to work at a redemption center where people went to collect merchandise after filling books of stamps accumulated through various customer loyalty programs offered by supermarkets in the 1950s. My mother's family had fled from Berlin to Amsterdam with the rise of the Nazis. They'd left everything behind, and my mom's mother had divorced, which was rare at the time. After my grandmother had remarried, they'd moved to New York. Members of my mother's family were condescending toward other people, and they weren't beyond ridiculing me about my hair and clothes. I slowly came to realize there was no foundation for the arrogance and sense of self-righteousness shared by my mother's side of the family. They weren't successful, they were just dismissive. If you didn't agree with my mother, you frequently heard a derisive, oh, please, delivered with a contempt that made it clear your opinion carried no merit at all. My dad's parents were from Poland, and he was the youngest of four children. My dad told me his oldest brother, Jack, was a bookie and an alcoholic. His other brother, Joe, suffered from uncontrollable manic mood swings that crippled him throughout his life. And my father's sister, Monica, apparently surrendered to pressure from their mother not to leave the nest and never married. Even as a child, I couldn't help but see that expectation as manipulative and selfish on my grandmother's part. My dad spoke of a very difficult and unhappy childhood. He despised his father, who died before I was born. My parents were not happy people. I don't know what the basis for their marriage was beyond what later became known as codependency. They didn't provide anything positive for each other. There was no warmth or affection in the house. Fridays were often the worst day of the week. My dad would be agitated, and the outcome was inevitable. My parents would get into a fight, and then my dad wouldn't talk to my mom for the entire weekend. It's childish to act like that for an hour. It's insane to see your own parents acting like that for days on end. In addition to whatever issues they had between themselves, my parents were also consumed with my sister, who got into a lot of trouble and eventually spent many years in and out of mental institutions. Since I was always viewed as the good kid, I got progressively less attention at home. In my case, being the good kid didn't mean I was praised. It meant I was ignored. As a result, I pretty much had free license to do anything. I did not find this a very secure feeling. Security comes from having boundaries and limitations, and without any, I felt lost and unprotected, exposed, and vulnerable. I didn't want or relish the freedom. In fact, it was almost the opposite. I was nearly paralyzed by fear because nobody was there to tell me I was safe. I was alone a lot. I approached every day with a sense of foreboding as I faced the unknown without any safety net. Every new day was uncertain, every new day was unprotected, every new day meant dealing with a world I wasn't equipped to deal with and trying to decipher the unspoken messages at home. I found refuge in music. Music was one of the few great gifts my parents gave me and I will be forever grateful to them for it. They may have left me feeling completely adrift, but they unknowingly provided me a lifeline. I'll never forget hearing Beethoven's Piano Concerto No. 5 in E-flat major, the Emperor Concerto, for the first time. I was five, and I was completely blown away. My parents made culture and the art seem a natural part of life. Their appreciation of classical music was palpable. They had a big wooden Harman Kardon radio phonograph console and listened to Sibelius and Schumann and Mozart. But it was Beethoven that left me dumbfounded. On the weekends, I listened to Live from the Met on WQXR with my mom, a tradition I continued even as I got older. Once I started listening to the radio, I also discovered rock and roll. Whether it was Eddie Cochran, Little Richard, or Dion and the Belmonts, it was pure magic. 
They sang about a glorified life of teenagers that I quickly came to dream of. All that singing about an idyllic concept of youth touched me emotionally. It filled me with the wonder of being a teen and transported me to a wonderful place, a place where life's angst concerned relationships and love. Man, what perfect lives these young people lived. One afternoon, I went for a walk with my grandmother. We crossed the 207th Street Bridge into the Bronx, heading toward Fordham Road. On the far side of the bridge was a record shop. We went inside, and my grandmother let me pick out my first ever record, a 78 RPM shellac single of All I Have to Do is Dream by the Everly Brothers. When I want you to hold me tight, if only. While most of the other kids in the neighborhood were out playing cowboys and Indians, I sat indoors and listened obsessively to things like A Teenager in Love and Why Do Fools Fall in Love. For a time, a lot of standards were also turned into doo-wop tunes, and I used to get irritated with my mom when she sang the original versions around the house. That's not how it goes, Mom. It goes like this. Then I would sing the dip-da-dip-dip-dip part of the Marcel's version of the 1930s classic Blue Moon. Sometimes she was dismissive about the modern stuff, but for the most part, she just seemed to find it funny. And then I saw some of the singers and the bands I liked. The famous rock and roll DJ, Alan Freed, started appearing on the TV around the same time as the national debut of Dick Clark's American Bandstand. The wildness and danger of somebody like Jerry Lee Lewis wasn't lost on me as he kicked his piano stool away and flung his hair around. What was lost on me was the sexuality of the music, not surprisingly, given what I saw at home. The romantic fantasy I envisioned was clean and sterile, and even as I got older, that's how I continued to view life. It would be many, many years before I realized what a song like the Shirelles' Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow was really about. Still, there was no argument these people were cool. They were cool because they were singing. They were cool because people were watching them and screaming for them. In that audience, these musicians had everything I craved as a young kid. Adulation. Wow. A few Jewish immigrant families like ours lived in the part of Upper Manhattan where I lived, but it was predominantly Irish. Our next-door neighbors were two lovely old Catholic sisters, Mary and Helen Hunt, who had never married. They became something like aunts or grandmothers to me. As my compulsion to perform like my new heroes increased, I frequently went over to their apartment and sang and danced for them. As soon as I could master any song, I knocked on their door and sang it for them while doing a little choreographed two-step, hopping from one foot to the other. When I sang, it momentarily tempered some of my doubt and pain. Everything just felt right. Chapter 2 When I was eight, just before I started third grade, my family moved from Upper Manhattan to a working-class Jewish neighborhood in a distant section of Queens. I had never seen anything like it. Trees lined the block, coming right up out of the pavement, and across the street from us was a plant nursery that took up an entire block. I kept looking for forest rangers, or lassie. Most of the adults in the area went into Manhattan for work, but the neighborhood functioned like a small town in the middle of nowhere. Within a few tree-lined blocks were a library, a post office, a butcher, a baker, a shoe store, an A.M.P. grocery, a toy store, a hardware store, a pizza parlor, and an ice cream shop. I noticed one thing missing, though. A record shop. Most of the buildings were two-story houses, some were divided in half to form adjoining row houses. Others, like ours, were divided into four apartments, two upstairs and two downstairs, with a yard in the front. I still shared a bedroom with my sister Julia, but my parents had a room of their own now. There were lots of kids in the area. My new school was PS 164. Instead of individual chairs and desks, the classrooms had two-person desks. I prayed the teachers would put me on the right-hand side so the kid I shared a desk with would see my left ear, the good one. I didn't want anyone looking at what I considered my bad side, not to mention that I couldn't hear people if they were speaking into my deaf side all the time. At some point on the first day, a teacher named Mrs. Sundyke called me up to her desk. I walked to the front of the class. She was looking at my ear. Oh, God, please don't do this. 
Let me look at your ear, she said. No, no, no. She started examining me like a scientific specimen. This was my worst nightmare. I was petrified. I was shattered. What should I do? I desperately wanted to open my mouth and say, Don't do that. But I remained silent. I took a deep breath and waited for it to be over. If I ignore it, it doesn't exist. Don't show your pain. Not long after that incident, I was taking a walk with my father. Dad, am I good-looking? He seemed taken aback. He stopped in his tracks and looked down at the ground. Well, he said, you're not bad-looking. Thanks. Ten points for my dad. It was just the perfect sort of encouragement that an isolated, hopelessly self-conscious young boy needed. Unfortunately, it would become a familiar pattern with my parents. I started to build a wall around myself. My way of dealing with other kids became to preemptively push them away. I started to act like a smartass or a clown, putting myself in a position where nobody wanted to be around me. I wished I weren't alone all the time, but at the same time I did things to keep people away from me. The conflict inside could be excruciating. I was helpless. A lot of the other kids in the neighborhood went to Hebrew school together, which reinforced their friendships from PS-164 and created others beyond school. My family lit candles and observed Jewish holidays in some vague ways, but we weren't very observant. I was never bar mitzvahed. But the reason I didn't go to Hebrew school had nothing to do with any of that. I simply told my parents I didn't want to go. What I didn't say was why. Sure, I felt Jewish, but I didn't want to subject myself to being around any more people. Life was bleak enough without putting myself into even more situations where I would be paralyzed by the fear of humiliation. Okay, school lets out at 3 o'clock. Hey, how about more of the same at 3.30 from a different batch of kids? Great. PS-164 did have a glee club that interested me, a chance to sing. Every year they put on a musical and they auditioned anyone who wanted to try out for a part. The first year I decided to audition. When it was my turn, I stood up on the stage in front of other people, opened my mouth, and expected to sing. But all that came out was a little squeak. I ended up in the chorus, an able seaman in HMS Pinafore or whatever. Every year after that, fourth, fifth, and sixth grades, I wanted to roll in one of those productions, but every year I choked at the audition. That same tiny voice was all that came out. I ended up in the chorus every time, despite the fact that when I sat through the auditions, I knew I could outsing many of the students who managed to land the leads. PS-164 was also the home to a scout troop. After I saw a few schoolmates in their blue uniforms, I thought about joining. When a new friend of mine, Harold Schiff, showed up in his uniform, I took him up on his offer to go with him to a meeting. Harold ran with the mainstream kids, but had also befriended a few loners like me. He was tight with some other guys in the troupe, like Eric London, who played in the school orchestra with Harold, and Jay Singer, who played piano. I had run across Eric and Jay in Glee Club, but their friendship with Harold was based more on attending Hebrew school together. I stuck to myself for the most part. Even when I joined something, I operated at the periphery. Everybody in the scouts was trying to get merit badges for tying knots or helping old ladies cross the street, but I didn't give a crap about that stuff. The only thing that appealed to me was going camping. And sure enough, we took some weekend camping trips. But I had a problem when I lost sight of the other people when we were out hiking. That was really the first time I realized that being deaf on one side meant I had no sense of direction. I remember standing in a clearing listening to someone yell, We're over here! I had no idea where the voice was coming from. Without the ability to triangulate the sound, it was impossible. I felt vulnerable because I didn't know where I was. Yet another way I couldn't place myself. My instinct was still to cling to my parents. But whenever I got home from a situation like that, looking for a sense of security, they let me down. Ignore it and it will go away remained the household mantra. Same old story. I would have loved more assurance and less hitting, but it just wasn't going to happen. My parents steadfastly refused to acknowledge the trouble I was having despite the fact that it was so obvious. I sleepwalked at home. Sometimes at night I would sort of come to and realize I was in the living room. Sometimes I was aware of my parents turning me around and directing me back to my bed. They knew. They just never acknowledged it or tried to figure out what was wrong. 
I also had two recurring nightmares. In one, it was pitch black and I was on a floating dock in a huge body of water far from any shore. I was stranded and alone. I started yelling for help. Night after night. I'm alone on a floating dock far from shore surrounded by darkness. I would wake up screaming in my bed. In the other nightmare, I was sitting in the driver's seat of a car barreling down a dark, empty highway. The car had no steering wheel. I had to try to maneuver it by leaning from side to side, but there was no way to control it. Night after night, these nightmares left me suddenly awake, screaming, confused, deathly afraid. Things with my sister were going south, too. By the time I was in junior high, Julia was getting more and more self-destructive. My parents started periodically committing her to state mental facilities. After she bounced in and out of state facilities, my parents spent what for them was a fortune on an expensive private psychiatric hospital. When she was at home, she ran away a lot, and my parents could spend days looking for her. Sometimes I woke up in the morning to see my parents had gone yet another night without sleep, and I wondered, will all this kill them? Julia would hang out in the East Village and crash at people's apartments and take drugs. Once when she was at home, she stole a drawer of silver dollars my mother had been collecting and sold them to buy drugs. I know now that what she was doing would be called self-medicating, but back then, I didn't analyze it much. When she was gone, she was gone, and when she was there, I was scared. One afternoon, after my parents brought Julia home from an institution where she had received electroshock therapy, they left us home alone. They just dropped her off and left me with a violent nutcase only a few hours removed from a mental hospital, who just happened to be my sister. While they were out, Julia got angry at something and started chasing me around with a hammer. I was terrified. I ran into a bedroom and locked the door. I sat there listening at the door, swallowing hard, praying my parents would come home. Oh, God, please come home. Then I heard a crashing sound as Julia started swinging the hammer wildly at the door. She kept at it. Bang! 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 The wood cracked and splintered, and the hammer began to wedge its way through the door as she continued to flail at it with all her strength. Then suddenly she stopped. The hammer was lodged in the wood, and everything went quiet. I curled up and counted the minutes, and then the hours. Will they come home before she starts up again? They did. What happened here, they asked. I told them that Julia had come after me with the hammer. But then they lashed out at me, as if it was my fault. They yelled at me, then they hit me. I had been so scared, and now my head reeled in confusion. You left me with her. That was your choice, not mine. She tried to kill me. School continued to be a challenge, too. When I was in grade school, I had tested my way into the gifted and talented track. At the start of junior high, I was once again placed with the gifted children. I wouldn't have made it on the basis of my grades. I was never a good student. But entrance to the gifted track was gauged purely on some sort of intelligence test. While my IQ apparently qualified me, I remained at the bottom of the class. I was the one they scratched their heads about. I guess they thought I didn't want to learn. What they failed to realize was that my ear put me at a terrible disadvantage. I simply couldn't hear a lot of what was said in class, and if I missed a sentence, I was lost. Once I got lost, I surrendered. I gave up because I'd lost the thread. At parent-teacher conferences, the teachers always told my parents the same things. He's bright, but he doesn't apply himself, or he's bright, but he doesn't work to his potential. No teacher ever told them he's bright, but he can't understand what I'm saying. Back then, kids didn't benefit from the recognition of learning disabilities. But my parents knew I was deaf in one ear. And yet, after every parent-teacher conference, they came home and admonished me. God gave you this wonderful brain, and you're not using it. I cried. I felt guilty. Tomorrow I'll turn over a new leaf, I vowed. Which was all well and good until I went back to school the next day and still couldn't hear at which point I couldn't follow what the teacher was saying, and there I was, feeling like a quitter all over again. I knew that if I didn't do something, things were going to end badly. Did that mean failure? Did that mean taking my own life? I wasn't sure. To live in misery, to live a lie, to take it out on other people, I knew this was all bad, and I knew it was untenable. 
I didn't know where it would end, but I knew it would end badly. It was a horrible situation, and I stewed over it at night. In addition to the nightmares and sleepwalking, I became a hypochondriac, in the extreme. I believed I was dying. I would lie awake at night, afraid to fall asleep lest I never wake up. Eventually I would doze off, unable to keep my eyes open any longer. It was the same every night. You're dying. You're in trouble. Then, lo and behold, I got my first transistor radio. It opened an entirely different world, a separate place where I could go whenever I put the single earpiece in my functioning left ear. Music once again became my sanctuary, giving me at least a fleeting sense of safety and solitude. And in February 1964, a few weeks after my 12th birthday, I saw the Beatles on The Ed Sullivan Show. As I watched them singing, it hit me. This is my ticket out. Here was the vehicle I could use to rise out of misery, to become famous, to be looked up to, to be liked, to be admired, to be envied. And with no rational basis, I convinced myself, I can do that. I can touch that nerve. I had never played a guitar in my life, and I certainly had never written a song. And yet, this was my ticket out. I just knew it. Immediately, I started to grow my hair out, aspiring to a Beatles mop top. Partly I did it for style, but it was obvious why the style appealed to me. I could cover the stump I had instead of a right ear. Somehow, this was lost on my parents. They badgered me as my hair grew out and threatened to cut it. One afternoon, not long after I saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, I bumped into a kid from my neighborhood named Matt Rail. He told me he had an electric guitar and played music. He was a grade behind me in school, but I was very impressed. All I needed now was an electric guitar, and I, too, could start playing music. And I thought I knew how to get one. For the next 11 months, as the British invasion quickly brought not only the Beatles, but the Dave Clark Five, the Kinks, the Rolling Stones, the Searchers, Manfred Mann, Jerry and the Pacemakers, the Animals, the list was endless, I pestered my parents for an electric guitar for my 13th birthday. It means the world to me, I told them. Chapter 3 On the morning of January 20th, 1965, I woke up excited. My birthday had finally arrived. Finally, an electric guitar. Look under your bed, my mom told me. I leaned over excitedly and peered under the bed. I saw a big alligator print cardboard case. It looked like an acoustic guitar. My heart sank. I pulled it out from under the bed and opened the case. Sure enough... It was a used Japanese acoustic guitar with nylon strings. The top had been cracked and shoddily repaired. I was crushed. I closed the case and pushed it back under the bed. I didn't want to play it. My parents came from families that emphasized the need to keep kids down rather than lift them up. That was how they thought kids should be raised. They had made a point of not giving me something I wanted before, despite the fact that it would have been just as easy for them to do. They didn't want me to get a big head, I guess. Once I had rejected the guitar, they made me feel guilty about it, never acknowledging their role in this enormous disappointment. My friend from Scouts, Harold Schiff, did get an electric guitar for his birthday a few weeks later. A powder blue Fender Mustang with a mother of pearl pickguard. He immediately started a band, and he asked me to be the singer. Harold's friends Eric London and Jay Singer, whom I knew casually from Glee Club and Scouts, soon joined. Eric played bass in the school orchestra and just plucked the same instrument as a stand-up bass. Jay, who already knew how to play piano, had recently gotten an electric keyboard, a Farfisa organ. Harold got another kid he'd gone to Hebrew school with named Arvin Miro to be the drummer. It turned out that I recognized him from Glee Club, too. Then I suggested we talk to Matt Rail, who lived next door to Eric. So Matt joined as the lead guitar player. Matt and I were the only ones in the group whose parents weren't doctors of one kind or another. Harold and Matt lived in houses as opposed to apartments. Their places had basements. Matt's older brother, John, already had a band, too, and his parents were pretty tolerant about noise. Harold's mom didn't mind the noise, either and we'd have the shift's basement to ourselves, so that was where we set up first. Harold's basement was finished. The walls were lined with knotty pine wood paneling. There was a linoleum floor and even a window. There was a door to the backyard, too, which was below street level. 
Harold and Matt would plug both of their guitars into one amp, and my vocals went through the amp used by Jay Singer's keyboard. I often banged a tambourine as I sang. That was something you saw singers on TV do a lot. Eric just had to pluck the bass as loud as he could. We ran through Satisfaction by the Stones and other songs by British invasion bands like the Kinks and the Yardbirds. And to take advantage of Jay's Farfisa sound, we learned Liar Liar by the Castaways. I loved it from the start. And even though all the kids had vague dreams of being rock musicians at that time, given the frenzy over the Beatles and the Stones, their parents had their lives planned out for them. These kids were going to become dentists and optometrists like their parents, and for them, the band was a lark. But I kept telling them, I am going to be a rock star. Matt Rail and I started hanging out a lot at his house. In addition to practicing together, sometimes we got to sit around during rehearsals of his brother John's band. Matt and I played music so much at his house that his mother eventually proposed a deal. If we refinished an old bookshelf she had bought upstate, we could officially call the basement our practice space. So we stripped the white paint off that old bookshelf and kept playing. Matt's parents were sort of proto-hippies. His mom had actually sung on the first Weavers recordings and was friends with Pete Seeger. She had babysat for Woody Guthrie's children. By the time I got to know his parents, his mom was still booking prominent folk and blues musicians for hootenannies in Manhattan. People like Sonny Terry, Brownie McGee, and Lead Belly, as well as Seeger. I listened obsessively to the radio and knew the pop hits of the day, but at Matt's place, I was exposed to his parents' amazing collection of folk music. They had tons of country blues and old-time music and lots of contemporary folk by the likes of Bob Dylan, Eric Anderson, Tom Rush, Phil Oaks, Buffy St. Marie, and Judy Collins. Eventually, I pulled my acoustic guitar out from under the bed, and Matt showed me some chords. Then I took a couple of lessons from a woman who had placed an ad in the local paper. The first song I learned to play was Down in the Valley. Soon, I had a harmonica around my neck and was trying to mimic the folk music I now knew from Matt's house. The band continued to practice, too, and that summer of 1965, we got our first gig. There was a mayoral election that year, and John Lindsay's campaign had a local office in our neighborhood. It was housed in a storefront, just an open room with bright lights. Harold was volunteering for the campaign, distributing pamphlets. I think he thought it was something mature and cool to do. And one day the guy in charge of the office was talking about some kind of party or rally and mentioned they needed entertainment. Even though he hadn't been talking to Harold, Harold piped up, Um, I have a band. They invited us to play at the event. I guess it looked good for the Democratic Party to have neighborhood kids playing. We didn't get paid, and not many people were there, but still, it was a gig. My first gig. Sometimes when the band practiced, I got Harold to show me bar chords on his Fender Mustang. The basics came pretty easily, but if I had realized then how long it would take me to become a somewhat proficient guitar player, I probably would have given up on the spot. At the time, though, it just drove me on. Messing around in the basement was fine, but I wanted to get an electric guitar of my own and get serious. I started taking the subway into Manhattan whenever I could to scour the music stores on 48th Street for affordable guitars. Those trips into town became pilgrimages for me. Between 6th and 7th Avenues, independent music stores lined both sides of 48th Street and a block up on 49th Street and 7th Avenue was a sandwich shop called Blimpy's. I'd get a sub sandwich there or a Texas chili dog covered in gooey yellow cheese and chili and onions at Orange Julius, and then I'd wander the music stores. Back then, you weren't allowed to touch anything. If you wanted to play an instrument, they'd ask, Are you buying today? And if someone didn't look the part, like me, they'd say, Let me see that you really have the money on you. So those trips to 48th Street were not about playing, but about soaking in the trappings of rock and roll. Drum kits, guitars, basses. And once in a while, I spotted a musician I recognized from TV or from the music magazines I was starting to collect. I was in heaven. As junior high progressed, I started skipping school more and more to hop the bus to the subway and head for 48th Street. I would arrive early in the morning, before the shops were open, so this Jewish kid would go sit in a pew in St. Patrick's Cathedral on 49th Street and 5th Avenue and wait. I also found a record store a block from the cathedral called The Record Hunter, where they let you listen to records. 
They had banks of turntables with headphones, and you could have them open anything up and play it. That became my idea of a perfect day, waiting in the cathedral for the record store to open, listening to music, having a chili dog, and looking at guitars. Exploring closer to home, I found that if I took the southbound Q44 bus from my apartment to the last stop in Jamaica, Queens, there was a huge two-story record store called Triborough Records. They had thousands of albums, and since it was a predominantly black neighborhood, I was able to pick up things I had not been exposed to before. James Brown, Joe Tex, and Otis Redding, as well as black comedians like Red Fox, Pigmeat Markham, and Moms Mabley. I didn't always have money to buy something, but just being able to hold the records and look at the covers was enough to make it worthwhile. After I saved money for a year and added the money I got for my 14th birthday, I went to 48th Street one day and walked into a music store called Manny's. Eyeing a guitar, I said, Can I see that one, please? You buying today, came the response. Yes. Show me the money. I plunked down all the money I had, and the man behind the counter handed me the guitar I was going to buy. A three-quarter size, two-pickup Stratocaster knockoff built by Vox. It wasn't much of a guitar, but it was the one I could afford. It was cheaper than anything else because it wasn't full size, and besides, I knew nothing about guitars and could barely play. But now, I really had my ticket out. Chapter 4 I began to try to write songs as soon as I had the electric guitar. Somehow it just seemed like the natural thing to do. Playing the instrument and writing songs went hand in hand. Whenever I heard songs I liked, I tried to emulate them. One of my first attempts was an homage to the Who's The Kids Are All Right. I also studied the song structures of brill-building writers like Barry Mann and Cynthia Weil, Jerry Goffin and Carole King, Jeff Barry and Ellie Greenwich, songs with a verse, chorus, and bridge with great hooks, songs so catchy you knew them already by the time the second chorus arrived. They were about melodies and telling a story. Harold Schiff's basement band had stalled, but Matt Rail and I jammed together constantly once I got my guitar. Sometimes a kid named Neil Tiemann would join us on drums. We called ourselves Uncle Joe and continued to add songs to our repertoire. Matt was having problems of his own, however, and at some point his parents enrolled him in a private school in Manhattan. My hair was really long now, but it was curly. At the time, I hated the curls because the style was straight hair so I'd buy a relaxer cream called Permastrate. It was available in nearby black neighborhoods. Permastrate smelled like ammonia and heavy chemicals, and it burned your scalp like nobody's business. You had to apply it to your hair, comb it back, let it sit, and then comb it forward. On occasions, when I left it in too long, my scalp would bleed. Sometimes I'd iron my hair, too, anything to straighten it out. The mother of another kid I became friends with, David Unn, called me Prince Valiant because of the look. My dad, meanwhile, had taken to calling me Stanley Fatass. I'd met David on at Parsons Junior High, and his family, like Matt's, were nurturing and artistic. His dad was a painter, his mom a teacher. Like me, David had really long hair. Sometimes when I skipped school to go into Manhattan and haunt 48th Street, he went with me. He was big into music, too. David and I also started mixing as best we could with the budding counterculture. One day, walking down Main Street in my neighborhood, I noticed a new shop called Middle Earth. It was a head shop selling water pipes and glass bongs and all sorts of drug paraphernalia. The people behind the counter inside had long hair, too. Maybe I would fit in here. I didn't fit in with normal people, that was for sure, but here, right in my own neighborhood, was an alternative. I started to hang out there and talk with the owners as well as a few of the customers who came and went. It wasn't about the drugs, though I did start to smoke pot once in a while. It was about seeking acceptance. To an outcast or someone in a sort of self-imposed exile, Middle Earth felt comfortable. Eventually, I started taking my acoustic guitar to the shop and playing it while hanging out. One girl in my school, Ellen Menton, treated me with an extraordinary amount of patience and understanding. I trusted her enough to try to explain some of my inner demons, but hinting at my problems didn't reduce my anxiety. Ellen wanted us to become a normal junior high couple, go to the movies together or whatever, but I was incapable of doing things with her in public, 
It felt too risky, too suffocating, too claustrophobic. What if someone started making fun of me while we were together? I also couldn't understand why she wanted to be with someone like me. With or without the long hair, I was a freak after all. I even asked her, why do you like me? Why do you want to be around me? It made no sense to me at all. Ellen and I stayed friends, but being with someone who was steadfastly caring was all but unbearable. Even riding the bus together to go see a movie involved risks I couldn't get myself to take. My dad decided to give me his version of the birds and the bees around that time. Out of the blue on one of our walks, he said, If you get someone pregnant, you're on your own. Did that mean I'd be out on the street at age 14? Great. I barely knew how to get someone pregnant, but now I knew it was a one-way ticket to getting thrown out. As if I'm not already on my own. I spent the bulk of my time on my own, at home, in my room, shutting everything out and immersing myself in music. Listening to my transistor radio, playing guitar, reading music magazines. My mom, feeling guilty about the way my sister's plight was consuming all her time, also bought me a stereo. I became an avid follower of Scott Muni's radio program, The English Power Hour, one of the early FM radio shows to highlight the latest sounds from the UK. In the spring of 1967, Jimi Hendrix, who had moved to the UK, was dominating the English scene and charts, and his music started to filter back to the States on shows like Muni's. When his first album finally arrived, it hit me like an atom bomb. I loved to put the Jimi Hendrix Experience album on my new stereo and lie down and press the big speakers against both sides of my head. Even though I was deaf on the right side, when I pressed the speaker against my head, I could hear through bone conduction. I also painted my room purple and strung a set of flashing Christmas lights along the ceiling. I played my guitar and looked at myself in the mirror, lights flashing, and tried to perfect jumps and windmills like Pete Townsend of The Who. But perhaps the greatest effect Hendrix had was on hairstyles. His hair was teased up in a huge puff, and soon Eric Clapton and Jimmy Page had done the same to their hair. Suddenly, that became the look. I remember the first day I blew out my hair. No more permastrate for me. As I emerged from my room and got ready to leave the house with my hair now exploding around my head like my hero's hair, my mom said, You're not going out like that, are you? Yep, see you later. It was time to let my freak flag fly. As junior high neared the end, I auditioned for the High School of Music and Art, a public alternative school on West 135th Street and Convent Avenue in Manhattan. I had been one of the best visual artists in my junior high. Drawing was my thing. But equally important, I hoped this specialized school would be a more comfortable environment than the meat grinders I had attended up to that point. I had gone from being stared at for something beyond my control, my ear, to being stared at for something of my own making, my outlandish hair and clothes. Most schools still had dress codes in those days, but the philosophy at music and art was that it didn't matter what you came to school wearing as long as you came to school. As I saw it, instead of being the freak in school, I'd go to a school of freaks. Chapter 5 Even though drawing was my ticket into music and art, I wasn't thinking very seriously about trying to make a career of art which turned out to be a good thing because it was sobering to show up at school in the fall of 1967 and see not only so many people who were as good as I was, but also plenty who were clearly better. I had pursued art primarily because there was no school for aspiring rock stars. Art was a backup plan. No longer. I knew now it was music or bust. Even so, when I headed off to school each day, my musical aspirations stayed behind, carefully stashed in my purple bedroom. Though I never told fellow students at school about my aspirations or tried to switch to the music curriculum, I was aware that music and art students had an impressive track record of making a musical impact. And not just on Broadway and in orchestras. A band called The Left Bank, who had had a big hit with Walk Away Renee, were recent grads as was the brilliant singer-songwriter Laura Nero. Janice Ian, who had just had a hit with Society's Child, was still enrolled when I arrived. One day, Matt Rail's older brother, John, came around to see me. He'd already had several bands, and we all looked up to him. 
His first band was influenced by the Ventures, surf music. But these days he was leading one called the post-war baby boom that sounded like some of the stuff coming out of San Francisco. A hippie take on folk, blues, and jug band sounds. They had a girl singer who took leads on some songs. That stuff was a bit like Gray Slick's first band, The Great Society. And the post-war baby boom actually played gigs. Out of nowhere, John asked me to join the band. They needed a rhythm guitar player. My mind raced. Why hadn't they asked Matt, who at that point was a better guitar player than I was? Maybe because I'm in high school and Matt has another year of junior high? Is Matt going to be pissed? Holy shit, a real band. This is huge. I didn't hesitate for another second. I said yes. Next thing I knew, we were rehearsing in the same basement where Matt and I had previously practiced. We worked on an up-tempo cover of Gershwin's Summertime. I also worked out a version of Born in Chicago by the Paul Butterfield Blues Band and even sang lead vocals. Everybody else in the band was at least two years older than me, which at that age seemed like a lot. What didn't occur to me at that time was that they would graduate high school at the end of that school year. But in the short term, I was all in. We had a few gigs in our new lineup, and then I suggested we try to get a recording contract. I said we should have some pictures taken, and I knew just who to call. That summer of 1967, I'd spent two ill-fated weeks at a summer camp near the Catskills Mountains. Or at least it was supposed to be a summer camp. It turned out to be a scam. Some guy got a bunch of parents to pay him to have their kids come up to his farm, camp out, and it turned out help him tear down an old barn. He called it a work camp, implying that his program represented a chance for city kids to work on the land. In the end, though, it had been kind of fun, and I'd become friends with one of the counselors who were as duped as the campers. His name was Maury Englander, and he was now working for a famous photographer in Manhattan. Maury had access to the photographer's studio whenever it wasn't being used. That was one of the perks of the job, since Maury was in the process of becoming a photographer himself and, in fact, would be working for magazines like Newsweek less than a year later. So I called him, and we arranged to go into the studio one weekend and have Maury take some promo shots. Maury was pretty wired in politically as well, and we parlayed the photo session into a few gigs playing parties for various anti-war organizations in early 1968 as protests against the Vietnam War were picking up steam. Club gigs were tough to come by because they still wanted top 40 cover bands for the most part. We played a lot of our own songs, and the covers we did were not the sorts of songs at the top of the charts. I arranged an audition for us at a place called The Night Owl. I had read that The Love and Spoonful had played there, and The Spoonful's jug band roots and good time sound weren't so far off from what the post-war baby boom was trying to do. But at the audition, the guy who was making the decision walked out while we were still playing. We didn't get that gig. Despite the slow going, I wanted to succeed and worked at it ceaselessly. Eventually, I managed to pass some material to somebody with an in at CBS Records, and an exec from the label called me. If you guys can play as good as you look, you'll be great, he said. He was referring to one of the studio shots Maury Englander had taken of the band. Before the guy ever saw us in person or heard us, he arranged for us to record a demo at CBS. I wrote a song for us to record called Never Loving, Never Living, but I was too shy to play it for the band until the day before we were supposed to cut it. And then our female vocalist decided to go for a swim in the fountain in Washington Square Park in Greenwich Village the night before, and she caught a cold and lost her voice. When we showed up in the studio the next day, my first time ever in a real recording studio, she couldn't sing. To top it all off, the CBS exec told us he wanted to rename the band The Living Abortions. The demo never got finished. Meanwhile, at Music and Art, despite keeping to myself the chance to see girls in T-shirts and no bras, another advantage of the lack of a dress code was more than enough to get me to school every day. But I soon found I was at odds with myself and everybody else. I looked hipper than I really was because of my hair and clothes. But my hair was blown out in part for one very specific reason, and I felt intimidated by the kids I thought were genuinely hip. As I slowly learned, covering my ear didn't change anything. Like everything else in life, ultimately it wasn't about what other people saw. It was about what I knew and what I felt. One day at school, one of the cool girls called out to me. 
Victoria was curvy and blonde with disarming blue eyes. It was well known that she had the coolest friends in and out of school. I was wearing a leather jacket with a fringe, which was a hip look at the time and a look not many people were rocking yet, even at music and art. A fringe, she said. I went over to talk to her and somehow mustered the courage to ask her out. It was like an out-of-body experience. Somebody was talking, and it was me, but I felt totally disconnected because it was such a leap into uncharted territory. She said yes, and I walked away in a state of exhilaration and terror. We went to a concert at the Fillmore East, but when we got there, she knew tons of other people in the audience. We wound up sitting with her friends. I was immediately intimidated because they were hip, and I was an uptight kid from Queens. They started passing a joint. I took a hit each time it was passed to me, and I got pretty high. Soon I was talking nonstop until Victoria said, What the hell are you talking about? That shut me up for the rest of the show. After the concert, we went back to her parents' apartment. I was still really stoned and also paranoid because Victoria had seen a chink in my armor and questioned my coolness. I ended up talking to her dad and continuing to talk to him long after she had slipped off to her room and gone to bed. I eventually slithered out of the apartment feeling like a complete jerk. From then on in school, she snickered whenever we ran into each other. I don't think she meant to be mean, but she wasn't laughing with me. Another girl I saw briefly lived in Staten Island. She was half Italian and half Norwegian and lived in an Italian neighborhood. She was hooked on speed. Between me being a bit stocky and her having no appetite, I often got to eat her lunch, which her mom lovingly prepared, not knowing who would actually end up savoring it. The first time I met her mom, she seemed to like me. The next time I went over to her house to pick her up, I wasn't allowed in the house. I can't go inside, I said to the girl. No, my mom thought you were Italian, but then she found out you're a Jew. That was my introduction to the wonderful world of anti-Semitism. After a while, the double whammy of my insecurity and my inability to hear what was going on in class had me falling into the same old pattern in school of getting lost, getting frustrated, isolating myself, and eventually cutting school as often as I could get away with it. I knew how many days I could be absent, how many classes I could miss, how many times I could be late, and I used them all to their fullest. Those were the school statistics that mattered most to me. I became a ghost, hardly ever in school and when I was there, nearly invisible. I sat in the back of my classes and barely spoke to anybody. Once again, I was living in self-imposed exile as a result of my defensiveness and social anxiety. Once again, I was beginning to shut down. Life was poisonous and desolate. My sleeping problems returned. Once again, I would wake up screaming from the familiar nightmares, sure that I was dying. I'm alone on a floating dock, far from shore, surrounded by darkness. Chapter 6 One night while my mom was on her first trip back to Germany, my dad came home late, smelling of booze. He started talking to me. We all sometimes do things we shouldn't do, he said. Oh, God. But that's okay, right? I'm your kid. Are you looking for absolution from me? Me? You want me to rid you of guilt for something you just did? I knew by this stage that I couldn't turn to my parents for help or support or approval, but I didn't expect them to dump their own problems on me. Suddenly, I remembered an incident that had happened a few years before. My dad had answered the phone one evening and was clearly disturbed by what he heard. He spoke quietly to my mom, and then they called the police. When the cops arrived, they asked my dad to recount what he had heard on the phone, and he told them that the man on the other end of the line had told him if my dad didn't stop seeing some woman, he would hurt my dad. He said he'd cut his balls off, piped my mother. We all just treated it as a case of mistaken identity, but now I wondered. Home felt like an even more dangerous place after that. It would be decades before I finally found out what was going on, but I knew right there and then that our house had become a potentially deadly whirlpool. I'm drowning. It was bad enough picturing myself barreling down the road in a car with no steering wheel or alone on a floating dock far from shore surrounded by darkness. Now it felt as if the floating dock was sinking. 
Whatever was going on with my sister was being exacerbated by my parents. Whatever was going on with me was being exacerbated by my parents. My home felt as fraught with danger as school and other social situations. I could not escape a pervasive sense of fear. I was only 15 years old and I was losing it, and I had nobody to talk to. Nobody. Totally alone. Petrified. What should I do? I could sense that it was going to end very badly if things went on like this. Am I going to take my own life? Am I going to go nuts like my sister? Julia had reacted to her profound issues by choosing a path that led to self-destruction and numbing herself. Obviously, that was a road to ruin. How I dealt with things was up to me. Sure, I was on my own, but I had choices. If I did nothing, that too was a choice, and I knew the consequences would be dire. I refused to be a victim. I wanted to fix myself. I wanted to roll up my sleeves and get my shit together. I wanted to make things work, to transform my world into one I liked. But how? I was riding my bike when it hit me. As I turned the corner near our house, a thought hit me like a sledgehammer. I need to get help. Otherwise, I suddenly realized I wasn't going to make it. Otherwise, I was going to make bad choices. Or no choice. I would just keep spiraling downward. Do something. Then one night, I overheard a friend of my sister's talking about an outpatient psychiatric clinic at Mount Sinai Hospital in Manhattan. Here was something concrete, a place you could go. It had a name and an address. I looked the hospital up in the phone book. I waited until nobody was home one day and called the psychiatric clinic. I made an appointment. On the day of the appointment, I took two subways and a bus to get there. I walked in alone and said, I need help. They had me sign in. Fortunately, I didn't need parental authorization, and it cost only $3. Someone took me back to meet a doctor wearing a white lab coat over his clothes. I didn't know anything about therapy. I just hoped someone would tell me how to live. I was surprised when all I got during our first conversation was questions, not answers. Everything was turned around. I wanted the doctor to tell me what to do, and instead he basically turned my questions back on me. It would be quite a while before I realized this was the basis of therapy. It wasn't about someone leading you through life by the hand. This doctor, a complete stranger, kind of furrowed his brow and looked away when I talked. Is he looking at me like I'm crazy? After that first session, I wasn't sure what to make of it. Still, I decided to try it again. Whatever it took. Roll up your sleeves. The next time I went, though, I asked to see a different doctor. Thankfully, they obliged. The second doctor was named Jesse Hilson. I didn't feel self-conscious around Dr. Hilson. He didn't look at me like I was nuts. He quickly made me realize that even though I thought the rest of the world was normal and that I was the outlier, that wasn't true. Plenty of other people had issues that plagued them, too. I wasn't alone. I wasn't the one person in a million who felt his world caving in, felt himself imploding. Thank God. This was progress. I was still yearning for some support and reassurance at home, and I told my dad that I had started seeing a psychiatrist. He was dismissive. You just want to be different, he scowled. Then he got angry. You think you're the only one with problems, he shouted. No, I knew I wasn't. My sister had problems, and I suspected my dad did too. Though who knew what he was talking about that night when he wanted my forgiveness? But I wasn't going to succumb to my problems or surrender in the face of them. I was going to try to tackle them. I was going to fight. I started meeting with Dr. Hilson every Wednesday after school. I would stop at a deli near the hospital, buy a turkey sandwich with Russian dressing, sit on a bench in Central Park and eat it, and then go see Dr. Hilson. Each afternoon when I left, I was already looking forward to the next week. Talking with Dr. Hilson represented a rope I could hold on to. Finally, I was doing something, taking charge of my destiny and improving myself. I was rising to the challenge. Chapter 7 In early 1968, not long after I turned 16, Scott Muni's English Power Hour broadcast a new hit on the British charts called Fire Brigade by The Move. It was about a girl who was so hot that you need to call 911, run and get the fire brigade. 
Now I was a dyed-in-the-wool Anglophile, and The Move was one of my favorite groups. And what I was doing at that point in terms of songwriting was taking inspiration from songs I remembered from the radio. When I heard Fire Brigade, I loved the concept. So I sat down and began to hash out a song of my own using the same idea. I hadn't heard the song enough to actually copy it musically, but I had grasped something that I really liked, and my chorus went like this. Get the firehouse, because she sets my soul afire. I called the song Firehouse. This was real progress. With every new song I wrote, my sense of purpose grew stronger. I may not have had a social life, but I had music and a dream. So many people are miserable, they need someone to entertain them. Why can't it be me? One day at high school, a teacher pulled me aside. Why aren't you showing up for class? Why aren't you applying yourself, he asked me. Because I'm going to be a rock star, I said. As the guy looked at me, his face betrayed his thoughts. You poor fool. Then he forced a half smile and said, A lot of people want to be rock stars. Yeah, I told him, but I will be one. Outside of my band, the post-war baby boom, I didn't have anything else in my life, just my guitar, my stereo, and more and more often, concerts. I envied the kids who had social circles and weekend get-togethers, but I didn't have any of that. I had not figured out how to be part of things. So I often went to shows by myself. It was something fulfilling. In 1968, I saw Jimi Hendrix live in a small auditorium at Hunter College on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. I saw The Who, The Yardbirds, and Traffic. I saw Otis Redding and Solomon Burke. I saw Hendrix a second time. Virtually every weekend, there were multi-band bills at the Fillmore East or Village Theater where I could see three bands for three or four dollars. I found myself bathing in music every weekend. There was a debauched kind of elegance to the British bands. They had great haircuts, they wore velvet and satins, and they were cohesive not only in their musical style but in their attire and personas. They had individual identities but also a band identity. Band members were stylish in a way that complemented one another. They also had a sexuality that American bands of the time didn't have. I saw a lot of those American bands, too, like Jefferson Airplane, The Grateful Dead, Moby Grape, and Quicksilver Messenger Service. Most of those groups looked like bums who had just rolled out of bed, alone. Seeing some fat guy with pigtails didn't appeal to me. When I saw a band with a bearded guy in it, I thought, What's Sigmund Freud doing in a rock band? I think the initial reason for the light shows they used on stage was to focus attention on the pulsating oils and colors on the screen instead of on a bunch of slops who looked like they had just finished panhandling. Most American bands looked like a commune gathering. It just didn't work for me. Combine the look with the way they sounded, and it's no wonder people took acid at their shows. I knew, however, acid was not for me. I saw a few people freak out on it at concerts, and I saw a kid from my neighborhood committed after he took it. I figured I was a prime candidate for a one-way ticket to the insane asylum. Better to stay in control. I had too many issues eating at me, too much turmoil, and I'd seen what drugs had done to my sister. I had a steadfast belief that losing control like that would lead me down a bad, bad path. The British bands became part of the template for what I wanted to do moving forward. And that template became more and more complete in the coming year or so as I saw Humble Pie, Slade, and Grand Funk Railroad who all created a church-like atmosphere, a religious connection to their audience. A frontman like Humble Pie Steve Marriott was leading a congregation, evangelizing for rock and roll. I believe! Of course, while I felt the music in my blood, I needed money to buy concert tickets and guitar strings and imported English music magazines like Melody Maker, New Music Express, and Sounds, which I bought at specialized newsstands after taking the bus and subway to Greenwich Village. But jobs were hard to find. So when my mother's cousin, who owned a Sinclair gas station off the Palisades Parkway, offered me a job at his station, I took it. The first thing I did was buy a rickety old Rambler from him so I could drive to the job after school. I had to go from Harlem, where music and art was, across the George Washington Bridge, and up to Orangeburg, New York, where the gas station was, work a shift, and then drive all the way home to Queens several times a week. 
It was hard work, partly because of the distance, but also partly because I knew absolutely nothing about cars. I was the most unmechanical, unhandy person. On one of my first days at work, a car pulled up and the driver said, Check the oil. So I opened up the hood and pulled out the dipstick. I knew how to do that. And I knew how to read it. You're down a quart, I said. Okay, he said, go ahead and put in a quart. Sure, I said, and I got to work. After a few minutes, the driver asked, Hey, kid, what's taking so long? Well, I had a funnel poised above the dipstick hole, and I was trying to drip the oil in there. I didn't know there was another place for adding oil. Despite my initial difficulties, this arrangement worked fine for a while. There was even an attractive female attendant whose regulation jumpsuit unzipped as quickly as mine. Then, one weekend, one of the local newspapers, which cost five cents a copy, ran a Sinclair ad with a one-dollar voucher towards gas. Readers could present the voucher for a buck of gas, then the gas station owners would send in the vouchers to get the dollar back from Sinclair. My mom's cousin had me buy as many copies of the paper as I could, transport them to a station in a borrowed station wagon, and cut out the vouchers. He planned to claim the dollar from Sinclair's corporate office without ever pumping the dollar's worth of gas. In exchange, he said he would reimburse me for all the five-cent newspapers I bought and pay me a cut of the money he got from the gas company when he redeemed all the vouchers. I brought in many carloads of papers, and he made thousands of dollars, but he never paid me back for the papers, much less a cut of the money he made. Swindled by my own relative, so I quit. After that, I got a job at an upscale deli called Charles & Company. It specialized in gourmet cold cuts, cheeses, and canned goods and had locations all around New York. I had to wear a wig to hide my hair. It was tight and gave me a headache, but I worked behind the counter preparing sandwiches and putting salads and spreads in containers, so it was necessary. A district manager of the chain came in one day, and after he had conducted his business, he came over to me and said, You know, you could wind up a manager of one of these stores one day. I think this was his idea of a motivational speech, but it had the opposite effect on me. I knew this wasn't where I belonged. God, no. Anything but that. In the fall of 1968, at the start of my junior year of high school, I learned that the post-war baby boom wasn't where I belonged either. At least they didn't think so. John Rail and the other members had gone off to college, most of them to Bard and SUNY New Pulse, upstate but not at the ends of the earth. I had figured we might keep playing during their breaks and that maybe I would go up on weekends and play with them. They had other plans. They didn't tell me I was out of the band. I figured it out when they came home one weekend with another guy, who was a guitar player. They were still playing together up at college, and this new guy hanging around was part of it now. That hurt, especially because they didn't tell me. I took stock of the situation and thought about what to do. I'm going to become a better guitar player. But just as important, I'm going to keep writing songs. No, there was something more to it than that. Make the most of what you have. There's no reason to wait for a band. So what if I didn't have a band? I had songs, and I was writing more of them. By this point, I had a reel-to-reel tape recorder I used to make recordings of my songs. With me, the music and melody had always come first, and I filled in the dots, including the lyrics, from there. Maybe I can get other people to record my songs. Some of the magazines I bought, like Hit Parader and Song Hits, printed song lyrics. And at the bottom of the pages where the lyrics were printed was always information on the publishing company and the songwriter. Well, if I'm a songwriter and need to find an outlet for my songs and don't have a band, I guess I need a publishing deal. I was such a loner that making a career in music on my own somehow made perfect sense so I spent a good deal of my junior year calling around to publishing companies and talking my way into auditions to showcase material. The one I remember best was at the Brill Building, because the place was already legendary to me. I went in with my guitar, sat in an office opposite someone who had agreed to meet me, and played songs to this stranger. The funny thing was that while I had always been extremely wary about opening myself up by bringing songs to the band, I found it easy to play them for people I didn't know. But even though some of the people were very nice and encouraging, nobody signed me. I still had a lot to learn about my craft. Chapter 8 I found myself hanging around Middle Earth, 
the head shop, and often I visited the couple who owned the place at home in their nearby apartment. We would shoot the shit and hang out, and I'd play my acoustic guitar. They had a friend in the same building who also played guitar, and some days I'd go to his place and jam. I never called first. I just showed up at their places. I smoked pot sometimes, and it was kind of fun sitting on the floor thinking of ridiculous things, suddenly becoming a genius, and philosophizing about life on other planets or about the bark on trees. It wasn't very productive, and I realized that if I wanted to write songs, I couldn't spend time smoking pot and eating sandwiches. I still had a goal. Socializing with older people, though, became an outlet for me. It kept at bay some of my neuroses about socializing with kids my own age. And it could be on my own terms. It wasn't like I had to see these adults at school every day. Around the same time, I became friends with a woman down the block named Sandy. She was married to a guy named Stephen, had three kids, and was in her mid-twenties. I started hanging out with her and her husband, like the couple at Middle Earth. I spent a lot of time with them. It was great not to have to be at home all the time. One day when I was hanging out with Sandy, she said, I have something to tell you. Okay. Stephen left me. That's terrible, I said, and gave her a big hug. We wound up holding each other on the sofa, and then she led me into the bedroom. Whoa, what's happening here? This is awesome. My sexual technique was non-existent, but I'm sure Sandy appreciated my enthusiasm. I was a human jackhammer, or a love gun. At that age, just taking off my pants got me excited. Having someone else there was a bonus. Up until that moment when I slept with Sandy, sex had seemed like something that would be impossible to find. This changed everything. Luckily for me, Stephen didn't have a change of heart about leaving her, so I started to drop by Sandy's house more and more. Her door was only a few steps from my own, and now it was the entrance to a sexual fun park with a thrill ride like nothing I'd ever experienced. These rendezvous could be pretty late because we waited for her kids to go to sleep. One night I called my house from Sandy's and told my mom, I'm going to be late. Again. Honestly, Stan, what's going on, she asked. Mom, she has a lot of problems. My mom knew that the couple had split up and seemed suspicious of our connection, but she didn't really want to know the truth. Once I understood that I had some sort of appeal as a young man to older women, my situation changed dramatically. The only thing my dad had ever said to me about sex was that I'd be on my own if I ever got someone pregnant. Sex, I was taught, was deviant and unclean. But man, did I want it. And once I got it, man, did I like it. And now, getting it this way, I didn't have to deal with any of the intimacy issues I would have to work through to persuade a girl my own age to have sex. I couldn't handle that. No way. I still saw intimacy as invasive. I didn't want anyone inside the psychological fortress I had built around myself. I did not want to be close to anyone. But now, I realized with older women, I could enjoy the act and then immediately hit the road. Do it and get out. And that suited them just as well as it did me. The floodgates were open. Soon enough, another woman from the neighborhood saw me with my guitar and asked me whether I knew somebody who could give her son guitar lessons. She was a divorcee. Well, gee, I can give him lessons, I said. I spent her 39th birthday in bed with her. I was 17. My instincts and hormones drove me into more and more situations like that. It was like a drug, and what a great drug. I now had access to something magical, without having to let down my guard and deal with a meaningful relationship or any kind of real intimacy. I never had to worry about anyone wanting more from me emotionally. I didn't see any rules. I never considered the ethics of what I was doing. If somebody's wife wanted to sleep with me, hey, that's fine because she wants to do it. The fact that someone else was often involved meant nothing to me. That was their issue, or would be. If a woman made herself available, that was good enough for me. The husband of the couple who owned Middle Earth seemed captivated by a girl who came into the store a lot. Then one night, at a party at the couple's apartment, he started hitting on that girl. I think the couple was moving in the direction of an open relationship anyway, but that night, the wife seemed upset about her husband going off with another person. 
so I wound up in another bedroom with the wife and a German shepherd that seemed as interested in me as she was. Hey, these people are all adults. I didn't want a girlfriend. I didn't want a relationship. That was scary. But I could still get what I craved in a completely unattached, unemotional way. In situations that might have seemed intimidating to others, there was, after all, a chance that somebody's husband might want to cut off my balls as my dad had been threatened or even kill me. Seemed ideal to me. I didn't confide in anyone. I continued to exist in my own little world. But sex was now one of the forces that drove me. It didn't matter where or with whom. I remember inviting myself to a party at a neighbor's house one night. I just walked in. They were using one of the bedrooms as the coat room, throwing all the guest coats on the bed. And I ended up taking a woman into that room and screwing on top of all the coats. A few people came looking for their coats as we were going at it, and they were absolutely aghast. But I didn't care. Boundaries as far as what was appropriate simply didn't exist to me. Where I had been alone with my music not long before, now I had sex. Sex! The beast had awakened in me. Another time, a girlfriend of my sister's slept over at our house, and I tried to crawl in bed with her. She pushed me out of the bed. The next day, my sister told my mom. I thought it was hilarious. In fact, it was a bonus to me that my parents were put off by my behavior. That just made it all the more appealing. I saw music differently now, too. When I saw Led Zeppelin in Corona Park in Queens in August 1969, in front of fewer than 2,000 people, the sexuality of what they were doing was palpable. The show was in the New York State Pavilion from the 1964 World's Fair, a strange semi-open-air facility with a mosaic tile map of the state on the floor, a multicolored plexiglass roof above, and flying saucer-shaped forms perched on columns nearby. Jimmy Page's sound hit me with the same impact that Beethoven had when I was a little kid. He wasn't just a great guitar player. He was a visionary who composed and pieced together sonics to perfection. Led Zeppelin took a music form that was by then familiar, blues-based rock, and made it into something new and something all their own. Robert Plant sang like a banshee. I didn't know anyone could sing like that. I'd seen Terry Reed and Steve Marriott, who had sort of laid the groundwork for what Plant was doing, but Plant was better, more commanding, more magnetic, more consummate. He created a style that didn't exist before, and for all his qualities as a singer, he was more than just a singer. Robert Plant was the physical embodiment of a rock god. Nobody looked like that. He was an archetype in the making. I remember the next time I saw The Who, Roger Daltrey had grown out his bouffant hairdo into long curls. Aha, he wants to look like Plant, I thought. Everybody wanted to look like Plant and sound like Plant. Everything on that summer stage was stunning. It was the closest thing I ever had to a religious experience. I had gone to the show with David Unn, whom I still saw sometimes, and afterwards I said to him, let's not even talk about that. Let's not talk about the show because anything we say will cheapen it. I'll never, ever see something this perfect again. Music, I knew, still represented my salvation and the ultimate solution to my deep-seated insecurities. I wanted the validation I had felt playing in front of crowds. While the post-war baby boom hadn't made a penny, we had played some gigs at places like the Beehive. I also liked playing the showcases at publishing companies. So I started playing with Matt Rail again, the little brother of John from the post-war baby boom. I had played with Matt a lot a few years before, and now we both cranked up our Fender blackface amps and started experimenting, sometimes joined on drums by Neil Tiemann. Often, we turned all the tone and volume controls on the two amps all the way up and created a trebly wall of noise. We managed to score a few gigs at a hippie venue called The Bank in Brooklyn, the building was the headquarters and home of some sort of commune spread over several floors of an abandoned bank building. One of the floors was covered in hay and kids could get donkey rides there. We played on another floor creating a loud wall of noise, our guitar screaming nastily. Matt didn't even face the audience for most of the performances. It was fun to be playing again, but clearly this wasn't the group I was going to bet my future on. Thoughts of the future began to eat at me as the end of high school loomed. 
I was coasting through senior year and had to think about my next steps. The pressure I began to feel wasn't about money per se. What bothered me was that other people were laying the groundwork for their future security. They were making plans to go to college and learn trades. I wasn't. Much as I believed in myself, there were no guarantees about making a career in music. Kids in my neighborhood were following their parents into medicine or law. Meanwhile, my hair was below my shoulders and I was an aspiring rock god. The percentages I knew were not in my favor. I spent countless scary nights sitting up thinking, what the hell am I doing? No matter how sure you are of yourself, you're going to have some dark moments of doubt. Your self-belief gets questioned, even if it doesn't disappear. I lay in bed thinking. I had a plan, sort of. It was more of a goal than a plan, really. I had something I knew I was working toward and something I was gambling on. But there were no milestones along the way to check off. It wasn't like working toward becoming an optometrist. What if? What if I don't make it? The fears came at night. Eventually, I plotted out a scenario of last resort. I would work for the phone company. That was a well-paid union job with good benefits. And if I could get a job as a phone installer, and they were advertising for them at the time, I would be able to work on my own, away from people, away from any bosses. I could do that. I would drive around in a van and install phones on my own. Chapter 9 Matt and I began to argue at rehearsals. I thought we were just messing around more than creating something or moving forward. I also felt he should face the audience instead of his amp when we played gigs. Things came to a head one day when Neil and I asked him to turn down his amp while we were practicing. Turn down, we shouted. No, Matt shouted back and kept playing as loud as he could. So Neil and I called it quits. We walked out and the group was done. Matt and I remained friends, even started working together as taxi drivers, but I think it was a relief for him in some ways not to be playing with us anymore. Of course, I wanted to keep playing, and since I'd been turned down when I went solo to the publishing companies, I felt a band was the right way to go again. Neil, who was working part-time at a recording studio by now, heard from a friend of his about a guy named Steve Coronel who played lead guitar. So we called Steve and got together, worked out a few covers, played a few of my originals, and started booking gigs. The band with Matt had never had a bass player, but Steve wanted to bring one in. I know this other guy, Steve said. The guy's name was Gene Klein, and he and Steve had played together as teens in a band called the Long Island Sounds. Gene was living somewhere out of town now, Steve said. He was apparently a few years older than I was and had already graduated from college. I didn't care whether he lived in Sullivan County or Staten Island. If there was a possibility that we'd be moving toward creating a real band, I was all for it. One night I went over to Steve's Manhattan apartment in Washington Heights, not far from where I had lived as a little kid. Steve's room was painted black, and in the room was a big, burly guy. Stan, said Steve, this is Gene Klein. Gene had long hair and a beard under his double chin. He was very overweight. I was pretty stocky back then, but this guy was huge. He was wearing overalls and sandals and looked like something from the then-new country music TV show Hee Haw. Gene made it clear right away that he didn't see us as his musical equals. He played some songs for us that I thought were sort of goofy. Then he challenged me to play one of my songs, so I played something called Sunday Driver, which I later retitled Let Me Know. He seemed completely thrown that someone besides John Lennon, Paul McCartney, and Gene Klein could write a song. It was a moment of realization for him. He was another guy who wasn't famous who could actually write a song. He was visibly taken aback. He mumbled, hmm. I was annoyed that he saw himself as operating at a level that qualified him to pass judgment on me, as though all that mattered was his approval. Particularly because I hadn't thought much of his songs, the idea that he was judging me seemed arrogant, condescending, and ludicrous. He made it clear that he felt himself to be judging from a higher plane, and I didn't like that at all. Gene, of course, had no clue about my ear, which was covered up by my hair. But I was pre-programmed to dislike being scrutinized and judged. It wasn't a nice thing to do as far as I was concerned, and I wasn't eager to work with the guy. Another night, 
Steve, a bass player named Marty Cohn, and I played a free gig at a coffee shop on Broadway and 111th Street called Forlini's Third Phase. The place was lined with styrofoam, and we played with a bunch of amplified gear. We played some originals and some covers, including Mountain's Mississippi Queen, and the crowd got into it. Gene came to that gig, too, because Steve had borrowed some of his gear, and he was clearly impressed. At some point after that, I answered an ad in the Alternative Weekly, The Village Voice, for a guitar player. When I rang the number, I found out that the guy who had placed the ad, Brooke Ostrander, was the keyboard player in a band looking for a lead guitarist, not a rhythm guy like me. That was the end of that. But not long afterward, Gene called me and asked whether I would come to New Jersey and work on a demo tape his group was trying to finish. He wanted me to come for a day or two. I agreed. Strangely, it turned out the group was working at the home of their keyboard player, Brooke Ostrander, and this was the same band Brooke had placed the ad about. Brooke was already a school music teacher. Gene, too, bragged about some white-collar job he had that paid $5 an hour, a fortune at the time. They had a home tape recording machine as opposed to something fancier that might be used in a studio, but we worked all day. Toward the end of the night, Brooke and I smoked some weed using a big fish-shaped bong. I was absolutely out of my head, and with the workday done, we listened to Pink Floyd and Jethro Tull until it occurred to me that I didn't know where I was sleeping that night. Come on into the bedroom, Brooke said to me. Uh-oh. That was one of the longest walks I'd ever taken. I wasn't sure what to do, but when he opened the door, I saw two beds in the room. Phew. Thank you, Lord. Working with Gene like that, I could see that we had some things in common. His family were Holocaust survivors. He was smart and serious. Even though he and Brooke were working in New Jersey, Gene turned out to live only about 15 minutes away from me in Queens. It also turned out that he'd had a band upstate during college, and they had played live quite a lot. He had a lot to offer. He could sing well and play bass well. He could write songs. Perhaps most importantly, Gene was focused. One thing I had figured out by then was that talent, like everything else, was just a starting point. What counted was what you did with it. I knew I wasn't the most talented guitar player or the best singer or the best writer, but I could do all of those things, and I had a complete vision of what it was going to take to succeed. A vision that included working, working, working. Gene wrote a lot of very odd songs. Maybe it was because he was originally from another country? I wasn't sure. He had one called Stanley the Parrot, another called My Uncle is a Raft. He even had one called My Mother is the Most Beautiful Woman in the World. Um, okay, that's a bit weird. Still, the more we played together, the better it got. Gene and I liked the same kind of music, and we could sing harmonies well together. I decided I wanted to work with him. I could see a bigger picture now, and despite his idiosyncrasies as an only child, teamwork was not Gene's strong suit, we both were intelligent enough to know how to harness ambition. And after all, it would be a lot easier to slay the dragon with a second person to help. As we continued to rehearse together, Steve Coronel ended up joining us too, and we slowly started to become something more and more like an actual band. Chapter 10 In June 1970, I graduated from the High School of Music and Art, finishing just a few dozen people from the bottom of a very sizable class. I was, in fact, amazed that I had graduated at all, given how little I had shown up to class. Graduating was a mixed blessing. I was glad to have school behind me, but I was scared shitless about being drafted. The Vietnam War was in full swing, and the last thing I wanted was to be drafted. I didn't need to go to Vietnam any more than I needed to take acid. During years of building fear, I had managed to accumulate some medical documentation of various problems, like back pain and other things I'd seen a doctor about. One day I went down to Whitehall Street in Lower Manhattan with my draft card for induction. They reviewed my records and quickly dismissed me. All my fears, the years I spent anguishing over being sent to Vietnam, had been for nothing. I told my parents the great news, how I had taken all my medical records to prove I wasn't fit for service. They looked at each other quizzically and said, 
Didn't you know you can't be drafted? Why? I asked. You're deaf in one ear. Aha! Shocked, I thought of all the times I had brought up the subject of the draft during high school. Every male approaching draft age was concerned with what was to come. I had made my fears clear to my parents on many occasions. That was one fear they could have laid to rest for me if they had ever told me I was ineligible for the draft. Why didn't you ever tell me? I asked. They turned to each other, looked back at me, and shrugged their shoulders. Ten more points for my parents. It was true that I couldn't tell the direction of sound, but I had never put two and two together, and nobody else had ever put two and two together for me. At that time, New York State had decided to make college available to any resident, and I thought that despite my bravado about making a career in music, I had better apply to the city college system. I had already stacked the deck so much against myself, maybe this new opportunity could be the safety net I might still need. Since I hadn't taken any of the preliminary tests and I had terrible grades, I was admitted to Bronx Community College. I got a student loan and promptly used it to buy a second-hand blue Plymouth Fury to replace my broken-down Rambler. When I showed up for the first week of classes, I didn't think many of the people looked like what I considered college material. They probably thought the same about me. Despite the change of scenery, college quickly proved to be a continuation of everything I had hated about school. I still had the same basic problem. I couldn't hear well enough to follow what was going on. And it wasn't as if classes took up an hour a day. I was supposed to be there nearly all day. And then there were the assignments on top of that. When I thought about the time I would have to devote to college, I began to see it as an obstruction. I was willing to put that much time and more into reaching my goal, but this wasn't helping me to do that. In fact, it was detracting mightily from it. It made it impossible. And for what? I was never going to succeed in the classroom. It was just a waste of time, and time, I reasoned, was the most precious thing I had. This is just more of the same. I don't belong here. This is not for me. I thought about the new band— the fact that I was no longer going it on my own. I thought about the ideas I had discussed with Jean, about getting a full-time rehearsal space. Sure, Jean had grown up an only child, his mother telling him he was God's gift to the world, and Jean believing it. Sure, he had his quirks, but then again we had real chemistry, and the two of us together were much stronger than either of us on his own. We had a battle plan. This is not for me. To leave yourself no plan B is a dangerous thing to do, but going to college was taking away from my focus. For a band, focus was success. I needed to live it 24 hours a day, not just nights and weekends. Wasting time at Bronx Community College was sabotaging what I was trying to accomplish. I had my Plymouth now, which meant I had transportation to get to and from rehearsals at all hours. This is not for me. After the first week of classes, I never went back. Part 2. Out on the Street for a Living Chapter 11 Jean Klein lived with his mother and her husband in Bayside, Queens. She called me the bum. The three of them lived in a three-story house. A tenant lived on the ground floor, and Jean and his family lived upstairs. One day I was standing in the front yard talking to Jean, who was hanging out the window. His mother leaned out and in her thick Hungarian accent said, Stan, please, this is a quiet neighborhood. In other words, I was from the wrong side of the tracks and didn't understand that things were different here in this nice area of town. In his mother's eyes, Jean could do no wrong. If I happened to call when he was in the bathroom, she would say, The king is on the throne. Even when he was on the toilet, she believed he created masterpieces. I, on the other hand, couldn't get a compliment out of my parents if my life depended on it. They went out of their way not to compliment me. I think they thought they were toughening me up that way. Jean could do no wrong. I could do no right. Of course, when you considered the particulars of my situation, it wasn't so surprising that Jean's mom thought I was a bum. My sister and her boyfriend drove around in a van, apparently selling drugs and also dropped acid daily, sniffed glue, and did whatever else they did. 
Ultimately, she got pregnant, but by the time she gave birth, she had separated from the guy. I was at the hospital with my parents when my niece Erica was born. My sister was in no shape to raise a child. She was still struggling with mental illness and still heavily self-medicating. One weekend, my father and I rented a van, drove to Boston, where she lived in some sort of commune, loaded all the baby things into it, and carted it all back to my parents' apartment. The baby was already living with my parents anyway. From that point on, interaction with Julia almost completely stopped. There was still fear and uncertainty about whether she would try to take Erica back or start a custody battle with my parents. Once, Julia came to the house to visit and was clearly not well. She was holding Erica and suddenly I heard the front door bang open and saw Julia running down the street with the baby. We had to run after her and grab Erica back. It was terrifying. As part of my parents' philosophy of not acknowledging problems, my niece grew up calling my mom, her grandmother, Mom. And because my dad wasn't comfortable choosing what to be called, he became by default Honey which was what my mom called him. Whereas Jean was a college grad earning good money as an assistant teacher or a clerk, he held several jobs during the first few years I knew him, I had bounced from gas station to deli and dropped out of college. Now I was getting ready to take the exam to become a part-time New York City taxi driver. While other kids in our neighborhoods were studying to get credentials for long-term careers, I had left myself no alternative but to succeed in music. I had no choice but to spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week, plotting how I was going to accomplish that. For me, it was all about work. You can gauge how important something is to you by how hard you are willing to work to get it. Fortunately for me, despite his mother's opinion of me, Gene seemed to agree that he and I were better together than on our own. I think our partnership meant more to me at the time, though. With a modicum of approval and somebody to hang out with, I eventually stopped going uptown to see my psychiatrist, Dr. Hilson. Gene, on the other hand, seemed to have more going on in his life than I did, whether it was girlfriends or jobs or whatever. On the surface, he also seemed more content than I was, more happy-go-lucky. From my perspective, I saw Gene as important to the plan, and the plan was all I had in my life. I had realized after being rejected by publishing companies that I needed a band as a vehicle to get my material out there. On my own, I was at least three people short of the team I needed. In Gene, I felt I had found another key member of the team. By that stage, I had met or seen a lot of people who wanted to be musicians and said they were going to be stars, but most of them didn't have the discipline and weren't willing to commit to doing the work. Talent was all well and good. The people who won, however, were the people who worked the hardest. Gene had a work ethic like mine. Once I landed a job driving for a taxi company called Metro, based near Queens Plaza, I had money when I needed it, but still had near total flexibility. I drove a big Dodge sedan with a flimsy partition between me and the back seat. The business was at a turning point at the time with fewer and fewer classic cabbies. The old guys with cigars were being displaced by people like me, actors and musicians, people who needed a source of income and a certain amount of freedom. I quickly figured out what the company looked for as a minimum take for a shift, so I could work to the minimum if I felt like it. Basically, how hard I worked determined how much I made. I also figured out where the wires were that lit up the bulb in the rooftop for hire sign. I learned how to twist it apart without looking under the dashboard. That meant I could take a fare off the meter without risking being caught by a taxi inspector who might see passengers in a cab with the four hire signs still lit up, a giveaway that you didn't have the meter on. Gene and I rented a rehearsal space on Hester Street in Chinatown, just above Canal Street in Lower Manhattan. The building was what we called Tenderwood. If you lit a match, the whole thing would have gone up. But it was great because we could leave our gear there instead of lugging it around all the time. The full band, me, Gene, Steve Coronel, Brooke Ostrander, and drummer Tony Zarella rehearsed there three times a week, but Gene and I were there a lot more than that. Although I hadn't been initially too impressed with Gene's songs, as we gelled, we started to write very effectively together. It was exciting to have a collaborator, someone creative and intelligent to volley ideas with, a writing partner. I didn't feel alone anymore. 
Gene was also a terrific bass player. He could play intricate, interesting runs and sing at the same time, something most people couldn't do. And his ability to come up with melodic parts to complement chords was a huge plus. Still, although I valued the partnership, I didn't necessarily value the way he dealt with things. He showed up late to rehearsal a lot of the time and never apologized. It wasn't unusual for me to wait more than an hour beyond our scheduled meeting time at a subway to go together to the rehearsal space. He was very much about himself. It could be maddening, but I paid him back sometimes. We often ate at a cheap Chinese restaurant on Canal Street where you could get a scoop of whatever dish you selected from the menu over rice or noodles for $1.25. One afternoon, Gene and I ordered plates of food and cans of Coke. The place was empty. When Gene went to the bathroom, I grabbed the squeeze bottle of hot mustard and squirted a big dollop into his Coke. When he returned, he put the straw to his lips and took a big swig. I just waited. All of a sudden, his eyes bugged out of his head and started watering, and he screamed, Oh, my God! He was three years older than I was, and I played pranks on him like a pesky little brother. Our funds were limited to a few dollars each back then, at most. One day we wanted to get some food while we were practicing but didn't have any money between us. So we took our guitars and went out onto Hester Street in front of the loft and played Beatles songs. The bucket filled up quickly and we had our meal ticket. We made so much money that day we figured we'd try again. But the next day, almost as soon as we started to play, the cops chased us off. That was the end of our busking career and our dream of unlimited Mushu chicken. I realized early on that Gene had been taught to value and appreciate money. Sometimes it worked out nicely. I often gave him my old shoes, for instance. Other times I stirred up shit. I threw pennies into the street in Chinatown because I knew he would run out and retrieve them. I used to just stand on the curb and fling them, and he would run into the gutter to get the coins. Whatever the disparities in our lives, Gene and I found common ground. We shared some touchstones— we both came from Jewish immigrant families, we both lived in Queens, but I think it had mostly to do with our style of work. He and I both gave 100%. The other guys in the band didn't seem driven in the same way. Tony, the drummer, was in the band for one reason only. He was a dead ringer for Geezer Butler of Black Sabbath. He wasn't much of a drummer, but he had a huge set of Ludwig drums and looked the part. He viewed himself as some sort of intellectual. He once came to rehearsal with a drawing that he thought would be perfect as a record cover if we made an album. The image showed the earth and a flower in outer space crying. He looked at me and said, You get it? No, I said. Yeah, you get it. I have no idea what that is. A flower crying on the earth? Okay. Because Brooke Ostrander played flute as well as keyboards, the band worked out a cover of Locomotive Breath, a brand new song by Jethro Tull. But Brooke sometimes had a problem when he sang. Saliva would go down the wrong pipe and he would double over coughing. He might be singing one second and then suddenly drop out. I'd turn around and see him choking. Lead guitarist Steve Carnell and I didn't always get along. After one argument, he started yelling at me. Do you think you're special or something? He shouted. Yeah, actually, I do, I said. I have an aura. From the look on Steve's face, you would have thought I had just shot his mother. You think you have an aura? Steve was incensed. Then Gene spoke up. He's right, Steve, Gene said. He does. Chapter 12 We played a gig in early 1971, billing ourselves as Rainbow. A community college in Staten Island hosted the gig, and I got crabs for the first time. You can get crabs from a bed. You can get them directly from a person. But I didn't get them from a bed or a person, which might have helped make it at least a little worthwhile. Instead, I got them from a toilet seat at that community college. Soon after the gig, I started itching, but it took a while before I put two and two together. I finally realized I had crabs when I found what looked like breadcrumbs in my underpants. Upon closer inspection, the crumbs were crawly things. There must have been a hundred of them. It was revolting to think they had been living on me, feeding off my body. It was the middle of the night when I figured out what they were, and I woke up my parents and told them I was going to the emergency room. I wasn't going to wait an instant longer to get treated. 
and it wasn't like there were 24-hour pharmacies back then. My mom was horrified that I might spread them through the house. Honestly, Stan, she said, what kind of dogs are you sleeping with? Once I had overcome my revulsion to the critters, I found it all very funny, and the fact that my parents were disgusted and revolted by my lifestyle was a source of pleasure to me. I might never get the approval and support from them that I so desperately sought, but hey, at least I was getting a rise out of them. In April 1971, the band played another show up in the Catskills, about two hours north of New York City, this time with a new name, Wicked Lester. We played fewer covers and more of the songs Gene and I had written. Back home in Queens, one day I popped into Middle Earth to say hello. The owner pulled a piece of paper out of the register and handed it to me. A guy from Electric Lady was here, and we got him to leave his number, he said. Electric Lady meant Electric Lady Studios, the facility built by Jimi Hendrix on 8th Street in Manhattan. To a musician, it was like Israel to the Jews. It was hallowed ground. I examined the note, which had the name Ron and a phone number scrawled on it. I couldn't believe they'd gotten this number for me. I dialed it and said, Can I speak to Ron, please? Which Ron? Shimon Ron or Ron Johnson? Well... Ron Johnson sounded more promising somehow. Ron Johnson. Please hold. Ron Johnson was a producer at the studio. I was connected to his secretary and left a message with her about my band, his leaving his number at Middle Earth, the whole spiel. I called back the next day, same story. Ron wasn't available. I called back over and over again, day after day, until I finally told his secretary, you tell him that it's because of people like him that bands like mine break up. That got him to the phone, and he agreed to come to our rehearsal space to listen to the band. Only later did I learn that the person who had left his number at Middle Earth was actually the other Ron, Shimon Ron, who was head of maintenance at Electric Lady. When Ron showed up, he liked what he heard. You guys could be as big as Three Dog Night, he said. There might have been a tiny morsel of truth to the comparison. We played a hodgepodge of styles, so sure, one song might sound like Three Dog Night, but the next sounded completely different. To be honest, Wicked Lester had no real style, no real focus. Even so, Ron Johnson said he would record us and then shop the tapes to get us a contract with a label. He presented us with something called a producer's agreement. Things were suddenly happening fast. I took the contract to Matt Rail's dad. He was a businessman and I trusted the family. This is a completely one-sided contract, Matt's dad told me. Not in your favor. We signed it anyway. This was a chance to get a record contract, to record at Electric Lady, to put out an album. We were not going to mess it up. Once we signed the production deal with Ron Johnson and started to record our songs, he began to line up auditions for record labels. One was with a newly formed label called Metro Media. Afterwards, Ron came up to us and said, They passed. We broke into huge grins and gave big thumbs up. Yes, we passed! No, said Ron dryly. They passed. Finally, Epic Records told us they would sign Wicked Lester on one condition. We had to get rid of Steve Coronel. It was the first instance when we had to decide whether this was about friendship or about success. We decided to let Steve go. It fell to Gene to tell him. The label replaced Steve with a session guy named Ron Lejack, and then Epic signed us to a record contract. We were going to put out an album for a major label. We even got a modest advance. I bought my parents a washer-dryer with my share of it. I was still living at home, after all. Ron arranged for us to record cheaply, taking advantage of unbooked time at Electric Lady. If a band session ended at noon and another band wasn't coming in until later in the afternoon, we went in and worked on our record. Often we waited around late at night hoping a band might pack it in by one or two in the morning, giving us time to record. It was always a bit of a crapshoot. Sometimes we sat around for an entire day before getting a chance to work for a few hours. The first time I ever saw cocaine was during those sessions. An extremely well-known band was recording in Studio A one night when we were in Studio B. I managed to talk my way in to hang out while they worked. At some point, one of them said, I need some fresh air. The guy pulled out an Excedrin bottle, poured some powder out of it, and snorted it. 
Later, the same guy came into our studio to listen to a playback of something we had just put vocals on. Since his band was known for its stellar vocal harmonies, I was hoping for some advice on our track. The harmonies on our song were questionable and clearly needed work. He still had his Excedrin bottle with him. He listened to the song and said, Man, that sounds good. He came down a few pegs in my mind that night because I knew it wasn't good. Maybe it was the blow talking. I don't know. Then one of his bandmates came in and asked whether any of us could set him up with a girl. I couldn't believe it. These were major stars. One was asking random people at a studio to find him a date, and the other had a vial of coke and couldn't tell that a tune was crap. This was the life of a rock star? Once we started recording, albeit sporadically, we didn't need to rehearse at our own space as often. But one afternoon, we all dropped by the Chinatown loft. Where's the mic stand, I said. Where are the amps? Where are the drums? Holy shit, everything's gone. We knew people sometimes got into the building. We'd even had a huge, wild-eyed mental patient in a green hospital gown and no shoes barge in on a rehearsal one night after escaping from a local facility. But we didn't expect someone to jimmy open the metal cover over the window leading to the fire escape. A plate steel cover and padlock protected that window. Or so we thought. The air went out of the room. I don't know what went through the heads of the other guys, but all I could think was, okay, how do we get past this? Was this a setback? Sure, but I never lost sight of the bigger picture. We don't really need that stuff anyway. We're in Electric Lady Studios making a record. We're lucky. We could borrow guitars if we needed to. We could use cardboard boxes as drums. We didn't need to rehearse at the moment anyway. We were at the studio all the time using equipment that lived there. I definitely needed more money, though, to replace all that gear. Gina and I also wanted to buy our own PA to be able to play live shows on our own terms. So I started working more taxi shifts. One of my favorite fairs had always been dropping people off at Madison Square Garden, the legendary arena in midtown Manhattan. As things were going downhill for Wicked Lester, Elvis played four shows there in June 1972. I picked up a group of people one of those nights. Where to, I asked. Madison Square Garden, they said. I smiled. And I'll never forget pulling up to the curb in front of the garden that night. Because in the midst of all the turmoil, one clear thought rang out in my head as those folks got out to go see the king in all his sequined splendor. I will be here someday, and people will be taking taxis to come see me. Chapter 13 By the end of the summer of 1972, we completed the Wicked Lester record. We had recorded some of our own songs, but also a lot of songs Ron brought in from publishing companies. Some of the songs had wah-wah pedal, others had horns. We had done what we were told, basically, and the result was awful. Gene and I both hated the album. We sat down together, just the two of us, and decided we didn't want to release it. In fact, we didn't want to play with this band anymore. It wasn't working as we had hoped, so we decided to scrap the record and part ways with the other guys. That proved more easily said than done. Tony the drummer said he wanted to uphold his end of the record contract, so Gene and I quit the band. At that point, we had no band, no label, and virtually no gear. But what had made us start working together in the first place shined through at that moment as we both had the same response to the setbacks. No band, no label, no gear, no problem. First off, Gene and I needed a new rehearsal space. We didn't plan on replacing our gear and leaving it to be stolen again. We found a place at 10 East 23rd Street called Jams. We initially rented space on an upper floor by the hour. We didn't have any gear to store there anyway. There was no immediate drawback to taking our acoustic guitars in and out with us. Soon, though, a space a few floors below became available to rent by the month. We took it. Our new space again had plate steel over the windows. It was a big empty room, and we lined the walls and ceiling with discarded egg cartons, thinking that would help soundproof it. Gene put a mattress in the space so he could sleep over on occasion, and we had a couple of rickety chairs. The overall effect was a bit claustrophobic, though that was also in part because we spent so much time there. 
Jean and I talked about the direction we wanted to go, and it became clear very quickly that we both wanted to create a new beast, something cohesive both visually and sonically. In a lot of ways, what we wanted to do was the antithesis of Wicked Lester. That band was all over the place musically, and we wanted to narrow things down. As for the look, Wicked Lester could have been just a bunch of random guys who happened to be waiting in line at the same bus stop. We knew we needed something like a mission statement in order to create the right kind of cohesiveness. I played him the concept album SF Sorrow by The Pretty Things in records by The Move and Slade. My first thought was to have two drummers, two bass players, and two guitar players, to make a sort of rock orchestra along the lines of what Roy Wood of The Move was trying to do after leaving the Electric Light Orchestra and forming Wizard to create a big wall of sound. I wanted to keep things tight, too. Much as I liked Led Zeppelin, I knew we would never be a jam band. We didn't have the ability to stretch out a song for 15 minutes. You need an extensive musical vocabulary to do that, and we just didn't have it. It would have been pointless and boring for us to try to stretch out at that point. Much of the time, Gene and I sat facing each other on the old wooden chairs, acoustic guitars in our laps. Among the first things we worked on were A Hundred Thousand Years, Deuce, and Strutter, the chords of Strutter were from Gene's old song, Stanley the Parrot. Although the original song was a bit offbeat, I always loved the chords in it. We started trying to recast it in the vein of the Rolling Stones, and the words just came to me. She wears her satins like a lady. She gets her way just like a child. You take her home and she says, maybe, baby. She takes you down and drives you wild. The whole glitter scene was about style, and the girls looked fantastic. Of course I wasn't doing so well socially. I spent all my time rehearsing or driving a taxi, not hanging out in clubs. God knows I didn't have a girlfriend in fishnet stockings or satins, but I saw hip women walking around the village and I saw other bands with their girlfriends. For me, it was singing about an ideal. I was celebrating something I wasn't really part of. But what the hell, Brian Wilson had never been on a surfboard either. My songs tended to be very much chord-based, mainly because my ability to play riffs was fairly limited. So Gene would often supplement some of my songs with riffs. He had a better understanding of how to play notes and runs. On Black Diamond, for instance, he added a back riff that plays against the chords. The lyrics to Black Diamond were another example of creating a romanticized vignette about the life of the city. I mean, I knew about as much about streetwalkers as I did about Lilliputians. Gene and I fed off each other and filled in blanks for each other, lyrical and musical, as we worked. I remember the words to A Hundred Thousand Years hitting me on 23rd Street. Sorry to have taken so long, must have been a bitch while I was gone. On Deuce, the guitar figure that starts the song and then reintroduces it after the solo is mine. Even if both of our names didn't appear on any given song, our fingerprints were all over each other's songs. Gene and I also sparked each other with song titles. I had started a song called Christine 16, but Gene was the one who ran with the title and came up with a really good song. Black Diamond started out as a title of his, and I ran with it. There was no animosity or resentment, just the sense that we were working toward a shared goal. Each of us had a few older songs in complete form that we needed only to slightly retweet to make them fit in the new repertoire. She was a leftover of Gene's, Firehouse and Let Me Know were leftovers of mine. Together, we consciously tailored the songs to fit our concept of the band instead of just cranking out whatever struck our fancies on any given day. I was excited. We were doing things that neither of us had been capable of doing on our own up to that point. And we now had built the foundation for success, a rock and roll manifesto in the form of a catalog of strong, cohesive songs. Alongside our musical development, we molded ourselves into what we thought we should be. For the first time, I knew I was working with someone whose vision was as big as mine. I'd been around kids who could play their instruments before, but Gene seemed to understand the whole package. The fact that your music or your musical ability was just one part of making yourself an appealing musician. Like me, he saw the importance of marketing yourself, not in a Madison Avenue way, but in terms of appealing to people, being engaging, promoting yourself, success wouldn't happen by chance, it would happen by design. Toward that end, we made a conscious decision to lose weight. Gene had already changed his name once from Chaim Witz to Gene Klein, so one more change from Klein to Simmons was no big deal for him. 
I had always hated my name and even told my parents as a little kid that I was going to change it. They said I could change it when I got older. Little did they know I was going to do it almost as soon as I was legally able. The chances of a rock star named Stanley Eisen seemed pretty slim. It just didn't sound like Roger Daltrey or Elvis Presley. Stars were supposed to be larger than life. Why was there no Archibald Leach? Because Cary Grant sounded better. Ringo Starr sounded better than Richard Starkey. It wasn't about hiding my ethnicity. I would just rather have been Paul McCartney than Shlomo Ginsberg. But I didn't want a stupid name like Rock Fury. I wanted a name like the people I aspire to be like, something easily identifiable. The question was, what sort of name? Ozzy Osbourne's nickname derived from his last name. Izzy Eisen? Nah. Then it hit me. Paul. That was a comfortable name. There was Paul McCartney, of course, and Paul Rogers of Free, another band I liked. I didn't want to completely give up who I had been, so when I thought about last names, I was happy that my thoughts went Daltrey, Presley, Stanley, Paul Stanley. Initially, I didn't change my name legally because I figured I'd go back to my original name at some point after our career took its course. In those days, bands ran their courses pretty quickly, and nobody then had made it to ten years, though a few, like The Who and The Stones, were closing in on it. I hoped for five years.